please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for the Stands, one nation, under God, the United States of America. All right, we are going to start off tonight's meeting with some information from the Valley Bread Center. We have Jerry Lance here to uh, show us uh, some information on the uh, most additional report. Thank you for having us here today. Thank you for having us here today. Um, glad to be back. Good to see some familiar faces that were here last time, so thank you for coming back again. Um, we're here to give a little bit of an update on we finished the report to look at the analysis of the building. So we want to give you a little update on how that's come out, the, our findings from that, um, the needs, and the assessment of what we've done there. We also want to dive into the solution. We got some great feedback on the initial stuff we gave last time, and we want to dive into what we've come up with, and then we want to talk about ballpark costs where we're at right now. So thank you so much for being here today. Once again, I'm Jay Daugherty from La Valley Brensinger. I'm the project manager for the project, and with me is Lance Boydale. Great, thank you. Um, just kind of looking at what we have in store, we've got about a 20 to 25 minute presentation, kind of go through each of these items, and I know we'll get questions after that. Um, we're going to talk about the issues and needs, the future vision, um, of what we're, what we're, how we're accomplishing that and getting to that, getting to those needs, um, our proposed solution, and then turn it over to you guys for questions you have related to that. Um, first thing, we have spent a lot of time on site. Uh, we've done a lot of investigations. We had a whole team of architects and engineers come through the building. We learned a lot from current facility staff, current end users, and really identified what are some of the deferred maintenance items, and what are some of the systems that are coming to end of life. Um, looking at your site, we did a full site assessment and understood kind of where are the wetland areas, what are these developable areas, and what are some of your needs. I don't think it'll shock any of you to know that there are some spaces um, like the parking lot that need to be addressed um, and some drainage improvements that need to be made. Um, but we didn't do a full thorough review of that. Um, we did rank each of your systems within the building in terms of where it rated them essentially in a scale of um, 1 to 100 as to what condition are they in. Zero being they don't function and 100 being they're brand new and good to go. You can see a myriad of systems there. Um, some of your bigger items are things like your fire alarm system. Fire alarm system is not functioning right now. It's got a 10% because it is limping by. It will detect you know, some fires, but it is not code compliant by any means. and something that needs to be addressed very soon. And you see other items um, like pavement, which you know, you you're most of the way through the lifespan of your pavement. It's time to reduce some of the pavement. Um, each of the systems kind of has a full report that you really love to read. There are full engineering reports available, system by system, that describe what the state is, the state is of them, and what the proposed solution is for each system. And looking at the building, um, one of the things we did also look at is um, what condition the envelope itself is. Um, there's a lot of exterior envelope issues with this building. There's a lot of windows that you can see after daylight through in the gaps. There's a lot of windows that are leaking, you know, warmer on the outside, cold air to the inside. Um, that are creating energy consumption issues um, and comfort issues throughout the building. Um, there is a full detail you can see here, all the exterior envelope items that if you were to do nothing, if you were to do no bonded project, these are items that you would need to start budgeting for to replace. Replace windows, replace ceilings, replace flashing that is starting to fail in your building. Um, we did do a very detailed report looking at specifically some of the items and capturing those, as I noted, fire alarm system, one of our highest priorities as it is a life safety system. Given that it's not functioning, we're working really hard with the school district now to create a short-term and a long-term solution for this system. We're also working with the fire department to make sure we're bringing this into both compliance to keep the students safe. Given issues, systems like this are safety for the kids, we that rises to the top of the list to say if you didn't do a bonded project, this still needs to be addressed, it needs to be addressed very soon. Um, we also looked at how the building is functioning as an education institution. Um, it's one thing to say this building is in, you know, needs some repairs, this building is in good condition, but the big question is how well is it functioning for what you're trying to accomplish here every day? Um, as you can see from photos like this, there is a lot of, there have been a lot of changes and a lot of space needs that uh, the 
been modified since the building was built. Obviously, this building was not built in an era when we expected to have this much technology in the classroom, this much technology in the students. And as a result, you know, the school has done their best to get by with what they have and make upgrades as they can within the constraints of the building they have. And looking at that, um, that has led to some electrical issues. Um, our electrical engineers went through and they noted that you have a lot of inadequate size electricity systems. Um, this is in terms of both the main structure, the panels, as well as the number of outlets in classrooms. Very often classroom teachers say, you know, I could do more technology in my classroom if there was a spot to plug it in, but I can't take you know, 25 kids and share one outlet. This building is not, as I said, not built for the way technology is integrated in education today. The school has made upgrades over the years. Admittedly, low cost upgrades is the best they can. Um, and, but you can see that some of the electrical upgrades they made in the past have not been fully code compliant. We have a number of issues that the electrical engineers cited, like resident integrated wiring coming out of the panels, not in um, conduits as they should be for a school. Um, things that we said, if you're doing major improvement project that should be addressed and brought into code compliance and brought into safety standards. Um, we did go through all of your plumbing systems and your mechanical equipment. A lot of these systems are end of life. Um, you can see you know, some of the plumbing systems are starting to deteriorate. Some of those even pen pipes are rusting out. That's why you're seeing the filter pen pipe the roof itself is end of life. And some of your mechanical systems um, really have extended past what we would normally see for life expectancy of these systems. Um, they've done a great job maintaining them, but they're literally coming apart at the seams. Um, and they're really due for replacement. With that replacement, it was a great opportunity to, be, to do energy efficient systems that are also um, better for more fresh air to students, something that's been a very hot topic over the last couple of years. It provides more outdoor air for students, it provides more filter air for a healthier school environment. Um, one of our, our big items was looking at, when we started looking at how do these areas work for education, we also started looking at how many of these areas are really undersized for their use. Um, we started diagramming that out. If you look at level one, you'll see several areas that are grossly undersized for the amount of students in them. One of those areas is the area you're in today. Um, as you can imagine, if you take the entire school population and try to fit it in this room, it's not only extraordinarily loud, it's extraordinarily crowded. It's really difficult to maneuver around. It's actually difficult to even function. It's almost impossible to maintain accessible clearances for any student with a disability. Um, there's several other areas that are undersized as well. Per Department of Education standards, areas like kindergarten classrooms. The Department of Education has a prescriptive standard. We should have a thousand square foot classroom. The building wasn't built with that in mind. It wasn't built with those rooms being kindergarten. So they've essentially squeezed them into an 850 square foot classroom because it's what they have. Many of the classrooms are undersized. You can see all the orange areas are undersized areas compared to Department of Education standards. It's something that if we do a renovation or addition, that we should look to write on and make this a better environment. Um, one of the items worth noting, it's also a lot of health standards that have changed over the years. So the nurses area, one of the areas that doesn't allow for adequate privacy, adequate separation for students who are sick, adequate separation to treat students. Um, obviously, a real hot topic for schools for the last year, um, but it's fair to say that you're not in compliance for any healthcare standards for your nurses area. That's something we would also look at. Right look at the upper floor, um, quite a bit more of the same. Our big issue with the upper floor it's not only square foot in the classrooms, but it's what students are on them. So according to the fire code, we're not supposed to have students that are in kindergarten or first grade on an upper floor of the building, um, or because they can't allow for safe egress for them. Fire code also says that we can only allow second graders on the upper floor of a building if they have their own dedicated means of egress and don't compete with other kids that egress. None of those conditions exist here today. Today, kindergartners, first graders, and second graders all do travel to the upper floor to access art rooms, library, music rooms, etc. And that's something that we really want to make right. Even though we're breaching the fire code and it is um, is creating an unsafe condition, we do need to work on trying to get those students throughout all parts of the day on the first floor so that we're complying with that safety. Um, as part of this too, 
We had highlighted the corridors. If you were to come here during the day and students are in session, or if you have been here, you'll see that the building generally lacks some of the modern needs that the school has, whether it's special therapies, or one on one meetings, or group meetings. Because they don't have space for that, they use the corridors. So if you were to walk up and down the corridors, you pretty regularly see a stairwell or in a corridor, a couple of chairs set up so that people can have a small meeting so the kids can work together, so that teachers can do the professional development. They essentially have run out of square footage and are using every square foot of the building to the best of their ability to implement the program and ask them to implement. So we kind of the corridors as this is not great space, definitely not great education space, which is what it's being used for on a daily basis. Um, furthermore, Pretty obvious, and you've got square footage issues when you drive up to a school and you realize there's temporary portable construction outside the building. That's existed for a number of years here, but we have several classrooms um, that are built outside the building now that don't fit into the building. There's also a need for additional classrooms due to some of the bubble years that are coming through. So, as a school district, there have been fluctuations in populations, and that forces the school each year to kind of rearrange their schedule, rearrange where kids go try and find where those bubbles come through um, and to accommodate you know, what the next bubble is. Obviously, with that fluctuation, it makes it really difficult to say all the parents will be together here. We don't know whether it's going to be three, four, or five parent classrooms next year. Um, and each grade level kind of struggling with that. It also exacerbates the issue of not putting the second, first K1 and two on second, second level expenses. Now, in addition to just looking at the nuts and bolts of the school, what architects and engineers can see with our eyes and documents and photos, we also did meet with end users, or with current users, including faculty, and administrators, to say what, you know, what works and what doesn't work for you inside the classroom, outside the classroom, as part of your curriculum. And we also asked them to look, tell us what you think you're going to need resources you know, 20 years from now. Some of this is big picture planning, but given that we're, we're proposing making improvements in this building, now is the time to do that to look as far forward as possible, to set up anything we do to be as flexible as possible, to accommodate both what we do today as well as what we think we're going to be doing in the future. With that in mind, um, we did send out lots of questionnaires, did a lot of meetings with every staff member that we can meet with, and got feedback. Some of the things that came to the top, they weren't big things. Staff weren't asking for quadruple size classrooms or these amazing you know, grandiose spaces. They had pretty simple, straightforward things. And the number one issue we heard from staff was, if you're going to make improvements here, can you please start by paving our parking lot so we have you know, clean, safe access in the winter to and from our vehicles that can be paved. As I noted, power in the classrooms, it's a big problem trying to implement the full technology said it's one of their top issues they mentioned over and over that current technology really needs more outlets than they have in these walls. Restrooms, there is a serious lack of restrooms in the building, both for staff and for student. For younger students, traveling to a restroom on the other side of the building can take significant parts of their day away. For staff, um, they have literally tenants to be able to duck in and out of the restroom. If the restroom's not available for waiting for the next period, um, something that's a pretty easy fix and not a real big pass. Over and over again, um, all the staff, whether they work in the space or whether they do duties here, say the cafeteria should be corrected. It's just undersized for the student body and the amount of lunches we're serving. Um, and then something that, that is actually both positive and negative is they have, you have extraordinary outdoor classroom spaces now and educators that are willing to use them, students that love to use them. And it's a really affordable thing. They said if you're going to make improvements, that's something that we do well now at. We would like to expand that offering so we can continue to make great outside learning areas and bring some of those closer to the building. What we heard from them was that we love using them. The older kids, they can get out, um, go to some of the ones that are more remote, get their learning, and come back. Um, some of the kindergarten teachers told us that inevitably, if they take 20 kindergarten kids and they get them all dressed to go outside, and we track all the way out to an outdoor classroom, the first thing someone does when they get there is say, I need to use the bathroom, and then they turn around and head back. He said, if you could just locate a few of them closer to us at the younger age levels, we can get a lot better use out of them and really move some of that age during the day. And then across the board, at really every age level, a lot of the staff said, 
we could really do a great job you know, with more education, more student-driven learning if you gave us some shared common areas, areas outside the classroom that we can encourage students to use in small groups. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment about what those spaces they're asking for to look like. So common areas, when they said, give me some common areas, well, they meant by that term was spaces like this. This is a school that was built in the last five years. It's got a very large common area. It's made for several classes to share. It's made for, you can see these students are really at that middle school level. Um, the way teachers use this space is, as we're asking students to be independent learners, to be self-motivated learners, to work with others, to be cooperative and collaborative, We've got to give them spaces that aren't inside the classroom to be able to work independently, to work with other people. As we ask teachers and specialists to meet with students one on one or one on five, we need to give them spaces to meet that aren't also inside the classroom while a lesson's going on. So these common areas serve a myriad of educational aspects for the students during the day. Now, this common area in the picture is actually bigger than what any of the common areas we're proposing are. It's just an example of what other schools are doing. We did look, several of the educators looked at other schools, like this one, this is the NFL in Kentucky, and they had said, you know what, if we had to share the com you know, some common space in several grades, if we had to share it with a few teachers, we're still happy to do that. This one is a large common area that this school said, you know what, we're going to have one common area, we're going to put them all together, and we're all going to share it, we're all going to use it for different ways, and we're going to do that with furnishings to keep it really flexible. We did look at ways to do this. Now, it's, it's fair to say if we were going to build a brand new building, we would be considering options like this, a very large common area right in the center. We did look at options to do that. Um, ultimately, our chosen concept couldn't justify building a whole new building just to be able to accomplish this one consolidated common area. Some of the common areas can be very modest and still function very well for what the educators told us they would like to use them for. Um, this is what um, this is what we did in another district this afternoon over in Rochester. It's simply one classroom taken out of a corridor to allow what we call kind of a missing tooth design. It's very important to take a single wall down and say, okay, these four classrooms that are closest to it now have a common area. We on the right and see some meeting space. So if we're doing some of those one on one meetings that need to be private, it was thought to do that. So it's a very affordable solution, create pretty small, modest spaces that can do a lot of things during the day. There's another view of a design like that. Um, and these are some of the things that we would, did look to implement in this existing building. We said rather than building a lot of new walls, if we can just take down one or two and create some space inside this building, we think we can do this cost effectively and meet the needs of what they're telling us they need for space to be able to implement. Um, we did do some community feedback. I mean, obviously, community feedback is pretty tough. I mean, just like tonight, everybody's very busy. Um, community doesn't show up in droves necessarily to give us a ton of feedback. We did our best. We did um, attend a few events, um, including the, the fair. We've had a couple of meetings here. All of our meetings have been public. We haven't had a huge turnout of public coming to all those meetings. We understand. I mean, I'm a parent myself. We're, we're a busy group. A few things we did here from the community was that um, we should consider air conditioning for the classrooms and climate controlled spaces. It's something that a lot of people, when their kids come home, they know it's very hot in my classrooms on a lot of days. And it'd be great if we could um, air condition some of those, particularly as technology grows in the classroom and throws in more heat loads. That anything we do should have community use. You're going to see that in our design. But that this school is called the community school for a reason. That we need to continue to look at any new space we build as to what the community benefit from if they don't have kids in school. And there was a fair amount of people that did come to me and say, you know what, we understand it's time. We don't believe this is you know, something coming out of the woodwork. A lot of people are fully aware that the building has the aging system, that it has square footage issues. I mean, the, the obvious portables out there um, have signified that for a number of years now. But most of the community just said, we recognize that something needs to be done here. That we can't just continue to do nothing. So the, from there, we did switch and say, let's talk about big picture visioning. Let's go beyond what we're doing today and figure out where do we want to be in 20 years. So we have a number of workshops dedicated to this. Um, 
and we, we distilled it down to 13 significant things about our school. So the first thing we asked is, what is great about you know, the Deerfield Community School? What do we need to know is extraordinary now, that makes us unique, that we wouldn't want any project to hurt, but the project would help. Um, a lot of the people we have know that it is great to have the size school that create environment, that as a district, we do a great job with technology, with the issue of the outlets and the cords, see here tonight that the district does support getting technology in the hands of the students and in the hands of the teachers when they when they when they can use it. There are wonderful things about being in this community, including you know that rural isolated site that gives you a natural connection to the environment was after a classroom to really help that. And students do have a really good understanding of how um, their space fits in with the environment, how they do. They do believe they do a great job. They're a really forward-thinking group. Um, the curriculum tends to be very agile. Um, they, they're very early adopters for new curriculum, for new teaching methodologies. Um, we have a great staff here that is that are forward-thinking and child-focused. They do a great job trying to be very inclusive. So no matter what student comes to them with abilities or disabilities, they're inclusive throughout their day. A lot of the staff noted they do feel supported from families and kids in their day-to-day -day life administration um, and the staff noted they are committed to always improving. Um, there is, if you're not aware, there's professional development Wednesdays. Um, they do this every week, so they're always looking towards what can we do to improve ourselves week to week, year to year. Most of the students did feel they have academic freedom, which is teachers felt they had academic freedom. That means they can implement new philosophies and technologies at any time to support um, intervention. For those of you who aren't familiar with that term, students that need um, additional care to that need some intervention to get them to where they are, where they should be in their learning, is fully integrated. So they have a full inter intervention team by grade level that integrates into the classroom. That is some of these some of the specialists that do need space to work. Um, the school does they have a full pool of resources, they're well staffed. Um, and they do feel community based. You know, the community has always been supportive, generous. The school board has supported um, educators that built throughout, and the school district as a whole has been very proactive in writing grants to be able to accomplish some of the things. So things like around our classrooms, but now that it's not been taxpayer funded. So we then pivoted to what what do you want? So this is what's significant. What are some of your desired outcomes that we need to be aware of as we start moving forward? Um, first thing to note is there are a lot of definitions for success, whether students are going stay in this community or move outside this community, whether you want to go to college or be career-minded. Um, they wanted to make sure that every student felt that they had a learning to set them up for that. They want the students to be confident and goal-minded. To do that, we need to have some personalized learning integrated. We do want students to feel connected to their community. I think they do a great job of that now. It's something that they're always striving to say, bring the community into our building, promote our students out to the community, make sure they feel like the learning they're doing is relevant. They want to continue to make sure that students can meet the high expectations of going to a large high school when they leave here. So they want to continue to coordinate that with the high schools. But at the same time, take the pride that we're coming from Deerfield as a, you know, a wonderful major community. They do want students in the future to, to feel like they have access to state-of-the-art facilities, state-of-the-art learning um, throughout, whether it's technology or classroom space. Ultimately, they want to create employable citizens in order to do that they believe they need to be critical thinkers and problem solvers um, that can collaborate with others. I think most careers today expect some degree of collaboration and cooperation with others to accomplish their job in an efficient way. So there are obstacles, and we ask them, what are your obstacles to be able to do that today? If, if things are what you'd like to do, what's what's in your way? First one is that they do have limited access. They recognize most of the educators we have with said, you know, we're not a city school. We don't have a huge budget, a huge tax base that we can ask for, you know, massive amounts of resources to do anything we want. Right now, the middle school specifically said one of our big obstacles is that we don't currently have family consumer sciences. They used to be called the home act. So we don't have an area to learn to learn about cooking, to learn about home skills. Set your personal finance, etc. 
and we don't have a technical education curriculum. We don't really have any hands-on learning, which is very atypical for an amateur middle school. So not just wood shop, but robotics, hands-on learning, anything you can build, make, you know, maker space type of space, they don't have that today. Um, all the staff across the board kind of said we, we wouldn't consider consider our school good, but we wouldn't consider it state-of-the-art facilities in their equipment. We wouldn't consider state-of-the-art either. They made you feel the, the need for adequate size spaces as they talked about. Personalized learning becomes difficult if you don't have a spot to take a student outside the classroom. It would be less personalized if you're doing it right in front of the other kids in the class. Um, and they do lack collaborative learning areas for students. Um, they lack some of the smaller spaces like professional development space, as I mentioned. Um, they noted that it's, it is work for them to work with the students to make sure they know that there's a bigger world out there and that they have a diverse thinking and culture. So although they love the fact that they're from a small town in New Hampshire, they also want to make sure the kids know that there's a bigger world out there and that what you see here may not be the world problems that you see in other areas. And one of the things that occurred to us a lot was the middle school identity. So the middle school does have some of its own areas, but without those specialty spaces that are in the science and tech ed, without kind of being any kind of self-contained within the building, there was a fair amount of sentiment that there really isn't a graduation from elementary school to middle school. They all kind of go to an elementary school. And the middle school kids are kind of treated as the oldest elementary kids, which would be ideal if they said, you know, we should have almost a threshold that you step through and say, maybe the middle school expectations are different. Um, at the same time, they said so they, they want to make sure there's no disconnect if we were you know, moving that direction, that the middle school should have its own identity, which should always identify as part of, part of the whole here. So there should be a lot of coordination between that fourth and fifth grade before they were successful. Um, and then their ability to develop multiple mindsets on the hospitals, they need to work really hard at that. Um, again, that's just you know, to be in New Hampshire, we're just trying to make sure that they, they do that. They can do that, they can do a great job of that through distance learning and technology to make sure that they're understanding what's going on in the world today. So to accomplish that, we asked them well, what learning models do we need to create in the building to, to overcome those obstacles and to meet your goals. First was, obviously, build a family consumer science space. Um, middle school right now does have a wellness program. And they do integrate foods to some degree, but at this point they're telling them about foods, telling them about cooking, cooking techniques versus actually demonstrating and letting them do it. Most students do learn by doing, in the latest space to be able to accomplish that. Build as a technology education area, an industrial arts area, a major space um, could be with lots of flexibility in robotics, everything from wood to art to 3D printing, kind of all the things where a student can build something with their own hands and learn from that experience. That goes into project based learning. Um, that's a term that you hear a lot today. Students trying to apply everything they learned in their classroom environment to create something. The issue to do that is you need space to store those projects. But when we move towards project-based learning, you can't ask a student to build us something significant, but make sure it only takes 45 minutes and you take it home and you enough. We've got to create space to store materials, to store projects that students are working on for a longer period of time. Um, technology education. If you've been up to the library, you've probably seen the nook that is the technology education area. It's about 400 square feet. It's about a third of the size of what we'd like to see for a technology area. They said, please get us some technology rich spaces that are adequately sized to teach technology. Um, and then collaborative common areas was a great theme. Again, teachers were more than willing to share these. They were not asking that every classroom has their own collaborative area. They said, just throughout the school, they gave us some whole school areas we can meet, some very little areas we can meet, small group areas, and individual one on one meeting areas so that we can get all of those things accomplished. So when we talk about the project-based learning areas, I know a lot of you are thinking, well, woodshop. Woodshop is a component to that. But today's project-based learning areas are really preparing students for how they're going to build things in the future. So these students are still a decade away from being you know, in industry, potentially two decades away, depending on how far they go in their schooling. Um, but project-based learning areas are really looking to integrate very high-tech areas that aren't 
overly expensive to build. So you're not seeing a lot of dust collection here. You're not seeing a lot of heavy machinery. We're seeing smaller robotics projects, electronic setups, and lots of tools for students to be able to build out of different areas. We are seeing some wooden areas, so you can see things like this. Lots of outlets, lots of project space, lots of storage space, lots of material space. So knowing all of that, we thought we were in a great, um, great shape to start proposing solutions. And that's what we're going to talk about now is the, the proposed solution of what we think will solve this problem. So just looking at the conceptual site plan, orienting you, the main building you can see is the square there in the center. To accomplish the added space we need, we're looking at building an addition on the right hand side, kind of in the areas where the portables are, and reaching towards the current parking lot. We are looking to pave that parking lot and upgrade the pavement throughout the site. Um, there are some site improvements, including you know, uh, a drive that goes around the building that allows for fire department access all the way around on all sides. We are making improvements to the drop off sequence, so that, that's expanded so that buses could come around and parents could come around in a separate loop. So it's a little smoother drop off sequence and safer. And we're doing things like you know, leaf field expansion, and paving, and water pump house and storage, and upgrading existing wells. And if you look on the left hand side, you'll see we've cited a proposed um, option for community center. We've talked a little bit more about that, but the way we're approaching that is the right hand side in the renovation of the building is one warrant article. The second warrant article will be put forward to also likely to include the community center on this site. Whether that passes or not, we do have a plan for that. We do have a site laid out to be able to accommodate that. In looking at the first floor, you see the main box of the building. We are right-sizing the administrative areas to make a more secure entrance. And we're right-sizing the nurses' areas and special education meeting and office areas up front. The way we're doing that is we're taking a look at the classrooms on each side, so they're essentially growing in place. As you come around the building, we're reorienting what classrooms we wear to ensure that kindergarten, first grade, and Second grade are all on this first floor. Um, the kindergarten classrooms are all being built out new, so there are a thousand square feet each, along with the preschool classroom being co-located with those. So those are here up to the side of the first floor. In the new addition, we've located all of these specials that are accessed by kindergarten first and second grade. That includes art, and music, um, and the media center, all to the first floor so that we can give them safe access on the main floor. We've also located a presentation area. That was one of the things that came forward from a lot of educators is that the current presentation area is the gym. The gym is so highly booked between physical education and extracurricular sports that presentations in there really don't work well. They're essentially conflicting. So we've created a modest presentation area right there at that level um, that can be used for a multi-purpose thing. So that presentation area so kind of a group gathering area. It's about twice the size of the room you're in now, or one and a half size of the room you're in now. Um, it is a taller space, so it can be used for theater type learning and larger presentations, lectures, that kind of space. It's also got um, adequate space, so it can be used for a number of things like dance and, and other things. Um, and it's well sized for community meetings. Um, we are proposing it to be technology rich, so those meetings could be streamed, they would have lighting in them. Um, again, trying to make a truly good multi-purpose space that the school can use during the day and the community can use in the after hours. Um, in the main building, we're proposing an addition to the cafeteria right up to the back here as a simple cost-effective solution. And we're proposing a full renovation of the existing building. Now, early on, you heard me talk about mechanical systems, plumbing systems, and things that need to be replaced. Our goal is that this entire building is essentially light new conditions. That's new roofing, new flooring, um, new mechanical systems, new electrical systems throughout. So full upgrades to that. On the left hand side, you can see our optional rec center. The rec center right now is hosting a multi-purpose gymnasium there. It does have seating, it has restrooms, and it has its own dedicated entrance. Looking at the upper floors, on the right hand side in addition, we've got the full middle school. 
So that's 6th, 7th, and 8th grade over here, um, right in the corner, along with industrial arts and family and internal sciences, and all of the necessary support spaces that go with that. So you'll see throughout this plan scattered several small group areas for interventionists, for specialists, for small group work. In the yellow areas, you'll see some of those little breakout common areas. Again, very modest spaces have that missing tooth design throughout the existing school, where we're simply taking down a portion of the wall and allowing for each grade level to kind of have its own little common area that they can do small group work. Just in terms of the diagram, go through those common areas you see by grade level. There's a rec center on the left hand side, the presentation gathering area, especially the classroom. And overall, we're looking at about a full renovation of the 71,000 square feet that's here and an addition of about 44,000 square feet. So, what that might look like in three dimensions. So, this is a conceptual rendering. There are still a lot of decisions that will be made post bond vote. What we wanted to do was build out enough into the concept that we could accurately price this. So what we're proposing is very straightforward construction. It is high energy efficient exterior walls. It's a steel construction or a steel building. It does have exterior masonry, so brick veneers, um, next to a few other material, just kind of break those facades up. In the existing building, we are replacing exterior windows, we're replacing the roof. You can see that we really worked hard to say that any space that we build, like that um, that central meeting space, we have direct community access to it. So both during the day and after hours, it could be used and it can schedule. You still have your main entrance. Um, we are replacing extra doors for energy efficiency. And you see the left hand side of the entrance, that community center should that be um, We're proposing on the roof side, um, you can see there's some solar panels there. We're proposing a power purchase agreement. Uh, zero cost to the taxpayers, you know, they implement solar. Um, benefits to that would be that another company would provide us with solar. And we would be purchasing power off that at a reduced rate compared to our current utility bill. So that would lower our utility bill, um, but we actually won't be investing in the solar as much as another company would be. Several districts in New Hampshire have done this agreement. Um, and it allows you to be more sustainable without having cost impacts to your taxpayers. Looking at this from the ground floor, you can see similar type of construction to what you have on site now. It is durable, it is very straightforward, it does have clear entrance points, and it does have it does ensure that all education areas will have good natural light. Looking towards that community center, um, you see the main entrance. Again, replacing the exterior of the windows, making energy upgrades, energy efficiency upgrades in the exterior of the envelope, um, security upgrades inside, but really renovating it. From the, from the box in. This is that, that community entrance to that, um, to, that, um, to that community space. Again, we've got an opportunity there to kind of create something that several groups can have to use. So, the big question, which I'm sure many of you have thought throughout this presentation is, so that's what you're proposing, what are the costs? Um, so we've partnered with Audit Page and Stone as a construction manager in New Hampshire. Um, they've got Became well qualified, they responded to an RFP, an RFQ, and partnered with us to provide us current construction dollars on what this project would cost. We've also then looked at the construction marketplace and carried in contingencies as well as escalation. It's fair to say that the construction marketplace is fluctuating highly now. If you've been to Home Depot lately or if you've tried to buy drywall, you'll notice that things are kind of going haywire. So, what we wanted to do was put together both our cost at this point, budget for this project that is realistic, and that does reflect kind of what we think the worst case scenario would be if the construction market continues to fall. Those of you who are unaware, the construction market historically in the temperature has risen about five to six percent a year steadily. This coming year, we're looking at up to a 10% increase. 
if this project were to be passed this March, it would be likely to bid out about a year from now, the following January. That would give us time to do the full engineering documents and competitively bid all scopes of the project. For the new construction, we're looking at about a 21 to 22 million dollar addition. For the renovations, this is including all of the mechanical systems, the deferred maintenance. We're looking at about $15 million in renovations there. The big item is contingencies. Um, carrying that extra 10% and carrying the typical contingencies that go into any project, uh, we're looking at about $6.5 million in contingency. One thing to note on that, if the contingencies, if the market doesn't continue to rise or if it stabilizes lower, then that money is money not spent, that's money is returned to the taxpayers. Um, we do want to go in to the vote, be very clear about the highest cost could be, and that's the number that we really want to go to taxpayers with. There are other soft costs in the project that includes engineering fees, permits, legal fees, contingents of or not fees, um, furnishings, and equipment, and technology. We add those up to about $3 million, and you're starting to understand kind of the order of magnitude cost that we have for this building. These numbers are exclusive of the community sector. We are still working on the price add the community center on the left hand side, what the cost of that building would be. These numbers do include the site work, they do include prepping that site for the community center and the community center being the first year. So with that, I'm sure you've listened to enough of my voice. I'll turn it over to questions. Population, will this approach bear? I can get you the final numbers if you bring the final numbers. We did look at um, taking the bubble year that we have right now, which is in which grade? The seventh grade? Seventh grade. So we have a third grade and a seventh grade bubble right now that adds one classroom per grade. This building accommodates that bubble happening at any grade level. So the Right now, most classroom, most grade levels have three classrooms per grade. Two of them have four classrooms per grade. This design allows for three and a half classrooms per grade. That means that any given year, you have 50% of your population coming through the bubble. What that does accommodate is that any given year we have a bubble, you don't need to rearrange everybody more than one classroom. Level. So the increased population of the leaves about an extra. I'll get the final number to you, but it is it is it's expanding enough to allow for those bubble years to happen more frequently. Um, and then just um, and this is maybe too broad and, and just like from sort of a, a generalized answer, um, if this goes to vote in March, you said then that it would you wouldn't have the final numbers until next year, correct? And then what is sort of the timeline of a project of this magnitude and then also clearly this is not a project that's going to be completed over the summer so we are going to be going through possibly one to two school years while this work is going on what have you seen other schools do in terms of how they continue learning through all of this work so we're working with our construction manager on phased implementation what we want to do is ensure that no students are being affected during construction that education continues detriment to have under the website. Um, preliminary just the big thoughts in the phasing plan are that we would start by re relocating the portables and then we would do the new construction first. We would separate contractors from students throughout the entire period that the new building was built. We move the students then by grade level into the new building and allow us to renovate this building in quadrants um, so that again construction and improvements are taking place and student learning is still priority one on site. Overall, the months of construction, you remember the months 20, of construction? 24 months, so two, two school years. So 24 months of construction is what we're currently planning for. And again, we'll continue to refine that phasing plan and work closely with the principal to understand how each phase would work. Thank you. 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 Th
Um, and then one last question. As that's going on, I get that you're prioritizing the new building, but then will you will you sort of prioritize those safety issues first, like the fire panel and things like that, before you even get to breaking ground on that? Yes, absolutely. So um, our goal will kind of unfolding from the bottom up would be to do the engineering and final designs and the bidding next roughly January. And we like January, February, those winter months because it's the most competitive months in New Hampshire for the contractors to bid on this price. That suits us for that following summer to use that summer and some of those first safety issues early on. The fire alarm is something we're considering to work with the school district on and you consider doing that in advance of this project because it's such, such a safety issue. But yes, absolutely. The first phase is really attacking the safety issues as much as we can. Thank you. I think it was really great. You did have one quick question about uh, phasing and implementation of that. I kind of wanted to build on that a little bit. Um, as Lance pointed out, safety of students is, is really important. That's that's a most important to make sure students are safe through all of that. Um, as we look at this, obviously we have an occupied school, we have students going through it. But one of the fun things is that students are seeing a building being built in the next year. These are the next generations of builders, the next generations of architects. So it's, it's great for the kids if we can turn into a learning experience for them that can build into the curriculum. We've done that in several school districts where I'll go in to a monthly meeting with some of the students to show them what the progress is and it's all safe. Uh, but it's it's a really great experience for this next generation of students. So it can be a really good experience. You said that those costs were not including the warrant article two for the community center, correct? Just want to clarify. Costs right now exclude the cost of the community center. We're, we are working on that budget. We're planning to have that in about about a week. Um, we're just working on trying to get good numbers for that. Again, our our construction manager is working very hard to say what is the current market and what is it going to be a year from now when we bid. So it's, it's reaching out to each of our community suppliers to say that, but we plan to have that very soon. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk about um, the implications of of doing nothing. Like uh, clearly, we didn't act soon enough, and you know the fire system failed. And I, you know, we saw from the percentages early on that some systems are failing or are operating at far less of a percentage than they should be than others. Do you have a sense of like if the community says no, what are the implications of that? Um, it's funny you should ask that. We we've been meeting very regularly with the building committee trying to assess all of these items. Um, it's one of the things we met earlier today. We said we've got to, we've got to outline the cost of doing nothing. Now that we got the numbers back from the from the trades, we can start putting together. If you don't do this project, you know, there are things that need to be done just to keep this go operational. Things like the roof is going to need to be replaced. The mechanical systems again, they're going to need to be replaced. The fire alarm needs to be replaced sooner rather than later just to keep your certificate of occupancy. We will be assembling the cost for that. It's fair to say it's significant. The fifteen million dollars in renovations we're proposing, if you look at our plan, we're not moving a ton of walls. We're not gutting everything out. We are replacing flooring finishes, ceiling finishes. If you look up, you can see why the ceilings have, have gone beyond their life expectancy, starting above. Um, but much of that $50 million is in the cost of the system. I don't want to say they're poorly maintained, they're well maintained. They're beyond the life expectancy of those systems are. They're just at the end of life. So we'll look forward to future meetings to be able to outline that, the cost of doing You guys don't mind just kind of elaborating on that, but one of the things that I think is worth talking about is like the cost of a roof from five years ago when we were looking at it to what you know the things we're looking at today. Because another big aspect of the cost of doing nothing is how much more is it going to cost in five years or anything. So as we evaluate the cost of doing nothing and knowing that if you fail if you fail to put a warrant order together, then the other option to fund these things through is your operating budget, your annual budget. So if we take things like the roof and say, you know, we're going to do that this year, which means we can't afford to do the mechanical systems, we're going to do 
that in two years. When we spread that out across 15 years, we're going to see significantly more cost than 15 years old. Just thinking about the construction market jumping you know, five, six percent a year, if we take 15 million and spread it across 15 years, many of these systems are going to cost double in five in eight years. Double the price. And the school district actually learned that about five years ago they priced out a roof replacement. Five years ago, they were told by another group that you needed a roof. That roof was about three hundred fifty thousand dollars. You today, what is the cost per roof? Eight or five. About eight to nine hundred thousand dollars today. Now, roofing has risen above many other trades. Um, that's risen more than the six percent a year. That's risen closer to about eight percent a year for that particular material cost. Um, but we're seeing that across the board. We're not seeing that. Any cost of materials and cost of construction is going to go down. Our hopes are they stabilize, but decline is unlikely. One, one last question, probably more for uh, the administration, but um, he said that uh, this new design could potentially cover about an additional 200 students. How many students additionally per year? I know we talk about bubble years, but I've been coming to these meetings long enough to hear to at like oh, it seems like every year is a bubble year is my point and like it seems like at this point we're at a trend less less of a bubble and more of a trend so I guess like my question is additionally like, average on average how many additional students can we take in per year just so we can kind of all do that math of the longevity of this yeah I know that there's been some like when a former board member was part of the kids you know there were some studies done and the projections I think the last two couple of years have skewed the projections a little bit um so it's, it's really hard to tell but if you go anywhere in deerfield you see that houses are jumping off the market as soon as they come back on and those houses are not just for a mom and a dad but there's kids in those houses um we we on any year fluctuate between 520 and 540 students um, I don't know what, what, what might be worth taking a look at what the projections are um, as we move forward with this. I, I think one of the things that is kind of safe to look at is the town, Deerfield, has continued to grow, which is uh, admirable for a lot of communities in our area. Um, it's difficult to pinpoint a student count when you're looking at the town growth because as the town is built out, not everybody has kids, kids age out of the schools, uh, you know, so. As you're calculating our houses, is housing turning over? Is it, you know, starter homes for lack of a better term, where young families are moving into? But this plan should allow for us to have about a 50% growth in student growth and, and be in a comfortable situation. If we put the town at somewhere around 7,500 residents using that kind of point, which would be a significant amount of growth for this community. And, a fully built out deer field is probably a, you know, a little bit larger than that, but I don't know that this community is going to let itself get fully built out like some of the other communities in the area. So I don't know if we're going to see our, our town turn into a or Chester. We have additional feedback questions for the design and architectural team. Anything? All right. In that case, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to this. And uh, I would say, uh, why don't we take a five minute recess to uh, give the gentleman a chance to gather your things and allow us to move on to the next step. Thank you. So. Next item of business of the minutes of December 15th. What is the wish of the board? Uh, who wants it? Yeah, all right, I'm going to give Jeff a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All right, Nate's getting a second. Okay, moved by Jeff, seconded by Nate. Any changes or uh, uh, comments regarding the minutes? Jeff, go ahead. The only uh, change I had was on the board article discussions. Um, so article two as written, I agree with article 
forth, I agree with, and just for a the object to strike, um, strike articles six and eight, which are in my notes. Leave article five until next meeting, which is fine. But then the motion said to strike article nine. Um, and there was no article nine. Oh, there was. Yeah. That was the increase in the preemption question. So I guess the only question is if we need to make a motion at the next meeting to strike the six days to make a motion to strike the nine. I think we're going to re we're going to review and finalize the other ones. Okay. We did strike six and eight. We did strike six and eight. Okay. I'll leave that okay. Anybody else? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, next up, we have public comments. Anybody from the public wish to comment? Please come to the table. Please try to keep to three minutes. Bobby Ann, I live on Brown Road. On December 27th, the CDC shortened their recommended quarantine period to only five days if a person is showing symptoms of COVID. Not sure if we've got that memo or looked at their website lately. They also changed their recommendations and said that if you're not experiencing symptoms, you do not need to quarantine anymore. It's on the CDC website right now. They now suggest that the positive cases follow up with five days of wearing masks only five days. Your trusted scientists only suggest wearing a mask for five to ten days after COVID symptoms start. You never had the right to force medical mandates on the children attending this public school, but tonight your decision is more imperative than ever. It's been more than three months with this board forcing ineffective and abusive restraints on the innocent children of this town. The parents and guardians that have chosen to vaccinate their children have had adequate time to do so. I'm not saying they can't still mask. Whatever you believe your child should do, do it. That's all on you. Um, medical choices are not in your job description and should not be made by anybody but the individual families privately. Today I'm encouraging you to vote and end this nonsense, please. I've already proven, proven, I've purchased all of the details. Um, that the majority of emails you received encourage medical freedom in this school. I also want to point out that the citizens who did email for parental choice gave more valid citations and actual scientific studies that prove the harm of face coverings on children in contrast to the very few that included articles arguing the opposite. Not only did you receive more emails requesting masks be optional, but you had a majority of people who actually speak to you at these forums, at your meetings, and come forward that believe in parental choice. Your community has spoken. It's time for you to listen. It's just a flu. Like, let's get over this, please. You do not have the right to make medical decisions for anyone else's family but your own. It's time to take the next step and make masks optional for your community's voting. One more quick note, um, I also wanted to address the urgency that Jeff portrayed at the last board meeting in concerns to the expansion, expansion project. It was stated many times by other board members and tonight that it all both warrants and all the money is gonna be voted on in March. I don't know what the rush is to get the money before then or why you're using other bonds for it now when they just stated tonight that they're gonna vote on it, you're gonna get the money in July. That's how it goes, and then they put the bids in in so next January. If I can clarify, we're trying to get the bond number done for the Warren articles. That's to have the voters vote on approving a bond for us to get the money to do it. Now. Yes. So we have to provide a number for the Warren article, for the bond, for approval by the voters, and that's what we're the deadline's working against right now. We're not asking for money now. We're asking for money to be approved in March to be allocated. But I don't understand why you can't just wait till March. Like he just said, it was a place the the company just. I'm oh, sorry. Um, yeah, there's legal sorry. Legal requirements for for when the when the requests have to be made. So there's a legal process involved in a bond, and that's what we're working with. Great. So, so you're doing it 
appropriately and not just say, let's use this one. But um, good, that's awesome. That's great news. Um, I just want to give, I did email Patty this today. Um, it's a right to, new, right to know request for all emails and all money transactions um, and everything to do with the expansion project. Thank you. Thank you. Some comments. Greg Whitmore, North Road. Ran the numbers. Zero cases. It was easy to run because there's zero cases right now. The town's down to 18. Uh, we're over the hump. Excellent. This is great news because I know that there is absolutely no reason now to not give parents a choice in school masking. Okay? We made it through. Excellent. And the great thing about this new variant Omicron is that it's extraordinarily mild. And it's moving through at such a rapid pace that it'll be gone like that. South Africa's already over it. Um, they're saying that by the end of January, we'll be over it too. So this is cause for celebration. And I know that you are going to see uh, the benefits of allowing for parent choice today. We've all been extraordinarily patient as we've gone through this. Um, we've seen throughout the state, throughout the country, that there's absolutely no difference in transmission between schools that allow choice and schools that force masks upon children. No difference whatsoever. If there was, they'd be screaming it from the rooftops every day. See, here it is, here is the proof. But there is none, and that's why we don't care about it, right? So, I'm just going back a few months ago when you said we're basing this on vaccination and the time is up, so today's a glorious day. I've been waiting for this for months. And I know that you're going to be true to your word and discuss this and realize that we are at a prime time to switch to parental choice, which is what it should be all the time because none of you have parental claim to my child. I know that. I do, but you don't. So I'm the one who decides for health choices. All right. Uh, why is high school choice such a mystery? I have no information on this. I sit here and I watch the school board meetings after I leave. What is going on with it? I want to know everything about it. Everything. I want to know what schools are in the running. I want to know what schools were eliminated. And I want to know why they were eliminated. I want to know what, uh, you know, how long of the uh, a term you're looking for. Is it five years? Is it 10 years? I want to know the potential cost of taxpayers. I want to know everything because that is incredibly important. I mean, you're talking about a 10-year contract? That's a big deal, that's a huge deal to me. I got a little girl and I'm wondering where she's going to high school. So, I want all of that information thoroughly discussed because it is public information. I'm going to be paying for it. I'm going to be sending my kids to one of these schools. So I want all of this information publicly discussed at the meetings as soon as you get it. Right? No more mystery, but let's hear it, okay? So I look forward to hearing that, and I look forward to sending my little girl to school without a mask as soon as humanly possible. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, sir, thank you. I appreciate your comments. Um, and uh, and yeah, I'm not sure how uh, how the conversation will go later today about the about the, uh, the mask. But um, at the last meeting, you had mentioned that you had a um, some peer reviewed papers. I would love to take a look. At that. Yes. Yes. I was. Yeah. I meant to do it, and I I remembered it today. And then I'll, I will get them to you tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Additional comments from the public? Christina? I did ask you for that. And I was so happy to see it. And it's excellent, by the way. We listen to you. We listen to you. Not me. I mean, the transparency is the man of everyone, I think. But um, I just wanted to uh, have two quick things. Um, the first being that uh, as we, I, and I know that the mask mandate is coming up and so there's going to be a vote on that tonight. Um, if you, I would respectfully ask that if you vote to keep the mask mandate, um, and I mean you like the individual board members who vote in support of maintaining uh, mandatory masking, that you 
before you vote or sometime in the context of the discussion, you speak to the specific uh, metrics, these specific items that you are looking for in order to sway your mind, whether that be specific directives, numbers. I want to know exactly what the goals are, exactly what you envision as being an offering for this, so that way we can all be on the same page, we know what we're waiting for, um, we know what you're waiting for, we know where your thinking is. Um, as others have mentioned, you know, we've all been very patient, we've all gone with it, the kids have done everything you've asked, the parents have done everything you've asked, so I think that you owe it to us to tell us those specific things that you are looking for in order to reverse that vote. Um, and then secondly, I just want to mention uh, for everyone here in attendance and then also anyone who might be watching at home, there's going to be one school board seat that will be open during the election in March. The candidate filing period for that is January 19th through the 28th. So you just go down to the town clerk and it takes about two minutes to file to run for school board. Again, that opening and filing period is January 19th through the 28th. And we will be voting on that position on March 8th. So put that in your calendar and I will be happy to see you. Thank you. Any comments? All right, so now we're going to move on. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Jerry View. Uh, you want to get a sense of the board. We're going to need to add one more meeting before next Wednesday. So I want to check the availability of the board members from Monday or Tuesday of next week. And six days from now. Yes, and six days from now. I just want to make sure that that was the plan, right? Yeah. NBC is on Wednesday next week. That was the day they gave us our premium either day. You're great. I am free either day. Okay. So. I will make my schedule work. Everybody else, seems to be possible, but one day if needed. So Patty has to just check some timing on a few things, and then uh, we'll get back to you all with a meeting announcement. So we'll get them posted. Gigi, will you open the Thanks. All right. Next up, we have two invoices from Dale. into your binders. So we have an invoice for $30,982.50. That would provide six buses for 15 days of student transportation. And that would be the month of December. What is the wish of the board? Move by Nate, seconded by Gigi. Sure. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The second invoice we have would be the December high school blessing, and that is for the amount of eleven thousand seven hundred five dollars and seventy cents. What is the wish of the board? Move to approve. Second. Move by Nate, seconded by Gigi. Any additional discussion? All in favor? All right. All right. All right. Look at that. Just some housekeeping. Okay. Uh, regarding correspondence, so at the last meeting we discussed adding the emails that are received by the board to our meeting minutes. Um, we did receive, it actually all came in today, so I spent a, a portion of this morning sorting the emails that came to me addressed to the board up to Patty, and so there is a number of them. Uh, they will be made available in the meeting minutes when they're published, so they'll be available for everybody to see. Uh, but they uh, they strongly encouraged us uh, to continue the current masking policy that we have in place. Uh, there was one or two, I don't remember exactly, uh, that uh, were asking us to uh, rescind Additional commentary regarding that. To be specific, there were seven emails that just started this meeting in favor of the mass mandate and one asking to end the mass mandate. Uh, and 
and then just a follow-up point. Um, the meeting minutes uh, in the email correspondence, there will be a lag between when they are sent and received. Excuse me, received. Right, and so when folks will be able to see the minutes. So if we approve the minutes at the next meeting, the emails that we're referencing tonight will be attached to the back of the minutes, uh, barring any items that Patty is going to use her discretion on that she feels is not exactly student sense of purposes. I don't think there was anything in those emails, but I will certainly let you be the judge of that, and not myself. And I, I just wanted to put on the record that I think it was stated at, at some point that we were like, not telling the truth about the numbers of emails that came in from here and there. Um, and so I, I don't think that any of us probably took all the emails collectively put them together and counted them. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that those emails come in, so it might be three or masking one week and four against and then following week it might be four. So it, there wasn't any intention um, to be dishonest about how, how the communications and correspondence were occurring about masking. Anything else regarding correspondence? All right, so fire panel update and future plans. Thought it's up. Right All right, so uh, I can probably jump in and handle some of it, at least on a high level. So the new alarm panel has been installed, it has been tested, and we are off fire watch. So that is done. There was a device outside that misbehaved that is currently being rooted out. The new panel did what it was supposed to do and notified us that the device misbehaved. Um, but the fire chief is satisfied with the current status of the panel. The engineers should be buttoning up the design of the new panel. I think Jeff, they said within the next, uh, I'm sorry, the design of the, the new system next week. Next week. Uh, and then the architects can go ahead and help us draft up a uh, bid proposal for us to be able to publish a bid uh, in the near future for a uh, installation of an entirely new system. Right. So, um, so just to make sure I'm getting this. The, the panel, with the, the emergency was, was fixed. We have basically a temporary fix in place. Well, you know, we have the, the panel is fine. The panel is fine. The panel is fine. So now it's the rest of the stuff that's tied to it. That, um, all the wiring, all the sensors, all the whatever. Which else. is a much bigger project. But the, the, the initial failure was in the panel. And so now what happens is it's it's going through and bringing the rest of the stuff up to the current state. Not the 25 year old standards of the title, but we have a fully functioning system. Do we have a price tag that could be okay for 200 pounds of what? We, dis we discussed the project in the order of that magnitude, but we don't have a yet. That wouldn't come to us. As far as the platforms. Yes, we've spent so far. Oh, we haven't spent anywhere near that. We haven't, okay, we haven't done that. No, no, no. Okay, no, so no. The, the temporary, the, the panel is literally less than that. Substantial. Okay, 30, 30, all the time. Okay, the rest of the funds are for all the wiring. The wiring devices. And meeting the new standards and looking at devices and the addressable. I learned a little bit about fire department. Okay. Yeah. Devices that communicate to the panel so that when the fire department shows up, it says it's this device in this room needs to be. Okay. Go here. So we won't need to okay more funds for the rest of the work. The rest of the work should be able to fit in the in the okay. I don't believe we approved any money because we didn't have an RTO. So we talked about the 250000 ballpark number that it's going to cost us. Um, what they went through last week and looked at our entire system. In two to three weeks, they'll have an entire design with specifications out that will go up the bid, and then they'll come back to us with those numbers. That's what we're Great. Thank you. So we have the building fund. All right. Anything else regarding the fire panel? Anybody have any other commentary? Miss Whitney, how's it look in the office? A lovely looking fire panel. <laughs> have you put a flower on it yet? Uh, Ryan's bringing flowers. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Nate, I'm going to let you lead the 
frequently passed question board document. All right. Um, Katie brought up a, a great um, you know, idea last meeting, and I appreciate that. Um, and we talked about last meeting the idea of all of these questions that people have. We've heard a few of those questions tonight, and those were different questions, and I think that part of our communication goal um, should be to, we, I think we've made some big steps over the last whatever five, seven years, um, but I think that when we don't, obviously, because people still have some, 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 some of these frequent questions that we get regularly. So the idea of frequently asked questions um, and uh, you sent me a couple of those questions. I, I didn't get any from, I didn't get questions from the group. And, got from um, and so then I put, um, he put sort of some draft things together. I kind of took the whole thing and I put into the draft, into the, the uh, folder, um, some of those answers that uh, we put together, basically. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to look at them. Um, I'd be open to taking another meeting to both get your thoughts on are those questions the ones that you most usually hear, uh, and number two are the answers that we put in there um, accurate, and this would be going to you know, obviously for Patty's uh, hopefully approval as well, and the administration approval as well, and, board this, and this would be a uh, kind of a board statement that I think would be good to send out. Um, we're hoping in the end that it might end up on the school website, not just the SAU website, um, because that's probably where a lot of people can start in this town. Um, and so, also, one of the things I did highlight a couple different ideas that maybe we want to sort of choose, and I can sort of talk a little bit about those more specifically but, um, in a second. Why don't we start with kind of big picture stuff? Are there any big picture comments, feedback that we have? Um, I think that there's some questions here that are um, will never change, yeah. and some questions that will be expansion in high school. Right. So I wonder if we just need to organize a little bit differently. Yeah. And, you know, and there's questions that come and go. You know, and that's uh, that's just the, like just the quick yeah. feedback. That I have. Yeah, I like that idea. Like, I, I sort of put in the January 2022, maybe this will be an annual thing. Oh, sure, sort of sure. Like uh -huh. Update, you know, take off ones that are no longer relevant, replace them with more relevant ones. I think that would certainly be the update. Or we can split it into two. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. It certainly covers an awful lot of questions. I tried to, uh, get, so, I threw some stuff in the he threw some stuff back in the and then I tried to include policies so that if folks are reading something and they're like, well, what you know, what else can I read to understand what's going on? I can't go reference this policy. So it should be all in comments. I think a huge portion of that is there are a lot of policies that we have in place that, that policies one of them. Let's go looking for a specific policy. You don't always understand why we have to do things with it. Is policy written, which is driven by you know state law, um, and so you know, closing that circle to help kind of just say this is why it has to be the way it is, and this is the law that we're kind of bound to, etc. You know, obviously all the policies are published, but you know, it's not something that we're yeah to go find which one to go find the the, the, the random policy that had them, you know, regarding the color of your toothbrush on a Tuesday or whatever. Andy, I was just going to follow up and say one of the um, asks that I have for the placement of this document is to be on the DCS page under like quick links. Because right now, all the information that we took to build this document is on the SAU site in different folders. So the idea is to basically make it more easily accessible. With the SAU, site and have been more recently updated. Is it possible to tie more links back and forth? I don't know how that works the magic behind the scenes or Google or whatever it is that makes it all happen. Really? Yeah. I've done not my thing. Yes, we, we send the links to DCS. They can. They can. They, can. Yeah. they can put the magic in? They can. Because I think there's a lot of stuff there. I don't think a lot of people know to or think to go look into the SAU page, right? So anytime we can reference it like that, could be. It would definitely need to be links because we ran into some issues with um, the school posting their own information for the board and the SAU posting different information for the board. So it definitely needs to link back and forth. So, so it's, so it's the official updated. Okay. Yes. So I'm certainly, 
is the the city website the SharePoint Space site? Yes. Yeah, so we had a, a word Yes. Just Kathy just needs the most updated version. Yeah. But she, she's saying that it should be Kathy that's doing the update, yes. not also the DCS page update. DCS just links to current one update. Correct. Correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So it's a little more language on one website. Yeah. <laughs> basically a redirect. Click here, you go you're going here. You go to the DCS here. website, you get redirected to where the file is. It's the magic button. It is technology. All right. Yeah. I have um, one thing that I noticed wasn't on here, and it's probably one of the most frequent questions I get is, what do I do if I want my child to go to school somewhere else? Yes. Um, so what should we have to make sure we have to make sure we have to make sure so can we add that to the list? Yes. Yeah, there, the there, there, are, there, are there are still people that are confused about that the conference is our high school and they hear that other students go to other places and you know, how, do, how, do, how do I address that? That's my concern. Yeah. Some information about that. And I can help you with the answer if you want me to, but that, we should definitely do that. I'll take a stab at it. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Um, before we move on, thank you for just sort of the on the same at the bottom of the, what's this, the third and the fourth page. Yeah, I think the third page has a question that says, How does DCS and the school board plan, build, and approve a budget? All right. Yep. Um, at the bottom, I kind of wrote all that sort of from a sort of school perspective with the bullets there. Um, Andy's take at the bottom is highlighted. He took more sort of like a business take on it. And so I know there's it's so different ways of looking at budget. Um, I guess I'm, I think we probably should steer towards one perspective or the other. Um, and so I would be looking maybe for thoughts on the board about either that sort of top section of the bullets I or, would, or some adjust, adjusted version of that. I would certainly lean on him more so than anybody else in regard to that. And maybe ask her just to uh, review it. First off, big picture, I want to say thank you for doing this. This is great. Um, second, I agree with. Splitting completely. I mean, a lot of questions that never change in the variable ones. Um, as far as the budgeting goes, I think this would be a great opportunity to, because it's the biggest number that the staff sees every year when they vote, a really good opportunity to explain the escalation of the budget and how it's not all these asks for, you know, gold plated toilets, but it's the healthcare costs of the township in the state and insurance costs. And, uh, Retirement costs and, and all of those and contracts and CBAs and everything else. It's, and not, you know, we don't need to go into the weeds with it, but when we look at what are the biggest causes of our budget increasing year over year, it's bed costs that are downshifted to us from the state. And I think that it could help explain the why, but also help us avoid that you know default budget, default budget. And I saw you had any of happens when you do go into which is great, um, but really help because it's an overwhelming document, our budget, and for someone to go through it and quickly say, oh, that's why, you know, this line has up 200,000, that's why this one's up 150,000. Um, and if I had more time, <laughs> I'd help you try and parse that out, but if we could do that, I, I think it would be really beneficial. I feel like maybe that would be a separate question that would say sort of like why the budget not going up, yep. and then maybe the answer what are the drivers Because it really is. The administrative budget is kept in check to a remarkable extent. And those increases are pre existing. Right? It is, it's, it's contractual, it's not in CBAs almost exclusively, um, or cross country. I think we've got everything. I think maybe a link to the the other piece that's really helpful is like Amber always color codes the budget. And when you see the, the, the colors with a quick explanation that um, these these are the things that we actually have uh, to be the power over and these and this color over here, I can't remember what those colors are mixed right now, are the things that we actually do not have any control over. So like maybe a link to the color coded budget. I think it makes an impact when you go like, oh wow, well there really is only like these X amount of lines that the school actually 
and the, the board actually has control over the person. So it's, it's kind of like a, just a different visual plan. So, so this is kind of like a, a literary version, and then with maybe a link to the visual version of like, that would actually probably be really helpful if we came down March as we want to try to get like past it to highlight what were the non discretionary increases. Okay. So that's I think it is. I think it is. It, it's, but I'm, I'm saying if we could break that down to a bite size piece for oh. the community yeah. and say this budget's about X percent this year, six percent, but it's like, here are the non discretionary items that we had no control over and we're going to keep up with it. This is what's going to stay. In the, in the past, we've I've, We've written something like that that's gone out of the of session today, basically. It's yeah. more specific to that year, the budget, what are the, what are the, what are the pressing issues that people are voting on in the voter session in March. This, I see, is less kind of a... I would you know, so, so I wonder whether those, you know, maybe those, I think we should do that again this year. We sort of have something in February when people come to the voter session that says this is what, what's happening. Um, and maybe there's a, a presentation of the, of the building again. All the stuff that we discussed in the door session. Uh, so having some background information would be helpful for that meeting. So we it sounds like we already kind of do that in the board session. Is that accurate? There's usually there's a summary published in the voter guide that gets sent out, okay. and then usually Amber does a summary of the budget and has that information in it. So we'll make sure that we have that as a pull out. In the previous years, I think I, we can't use we can't use SAU or district funding for this because that that crosses the line into electioneering. But um, I think I've just gone and photocopied a bunch of things that's on my own guide that basically is part of a one page. Here's what we're voting on, and this is you know this is what passing means versus this is what not passing. Means. I I don't think I did this last year. I did it in the previous year. Yeah, because it's possible that a summary is helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And the one coming from the town is not very detailed about it. It's kind of a very short description. Yes, correct. It's all just, it has to be applied to more than that. Yes, it's right. just right. information. Right. 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 So I think we have a couple other things we can add. We can put some magical links in it with a finger to thing. And uh, I think it's a good start. You know how we just export. What? I don't know what makes anything. I have a guy. When the, when the box breaks, I dial one two five three, and the guy goes in the box and he fixes it. Yeah. And if he's not in his office, we have a problem. All right. Uh, anything else regarding the uh, the you duck? All right. We're going to go to. Do you have we have Yes. All right. Is that very interesting? So it was an email from Kelly. I'm going to put it in. Um, okay. All right. So we are getting fairly good utilization out of the buses, but actually they are uh, not full. So uh, just to kind of disclose the numbers, uh, on the blue bus, we've been averaging 45 AM riders and 41 PM riders. Green bus 49, 49. Pink 47, and 47. Purple 36 and 36. Red bus is 35 and 41. The white bus is seeing the most use of right now at 58 both ways. And then the high school buses are 35 in the morning and 37 uh, on the way home. So uh, that's actually good. I mean, we're we max a bus at 72, three, 73 seats. So we're we're getting for the most part about a 50 to 66 percent utilization. We're not overcrowded. We're in good spot. It actually seems a little lower than they start with. Yes, very. Yeah. Now we're still at over easily over 100 cars dropping off every day. Do you think people just become accustomed to it, or do you think they're still concerned for the yeah. process? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Green, want your kids on the bus. Yeah, send another email, put them on the bus. Yeah. Um, drop off and everything is still going as smoothly as it can, considering the circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've, been, we've reduced the amount of delay years, so if there is a snowstorm, we can pull those off pretty quick and get there. Yeah, everything cleared. 
just say a white bus is the middle road bus. That's the one that's grabbing Hartford Road. Middle road, Rain Road, yeah, Hartford Road. That's always been the highest. Yeah. Well, that more of a, I think we're always, it goes down right now. Yeah. All right. So we're looking okay for buses. Dale's been able, been, been pulling through. I know there's been a couple of snafus mm -hmm. when they thought they were going to have an issue, and they fixed it mm -hmm. before it was an issue. So certainly, uh, I think it's appropriate for us as a board to thank Kelly for their efforts over the last few months. It seems like they've certainly stepped it up. And he's still temporarily driving. We're still hoping that they can hire somebody. Who's, she really only wanted to do that to help out, but it's turned into a. Yeah, it <laughs> feels that way. So mm -hmm. do, do we know if there's a potential lost driver in our future? We have not heard anything. It's already tough to see if she has anything. I think we should probably it'd be in our best interest to remind her that that was a temporary solution because when you're an employer and you've got someone that's coming to hold, it's hard to you know, think about it. But I highly you know, you know, hopefully we get the rest of this year. And, you know, very grateful to Amy, but to expect that as a long term solution on the other part of the employer. Right. Anything else for Dale? So we had um, a few revisions. The number one is still um, the article for the bond that uh, we need a, a number filled in. And I don't know if you wanted to, is that something you wanted to wait for that meeting for next week? So we have a better number. Do you want to do the first one, get that done, and then wait on the community center? So okay. that that's really kind of the trigger for next week. So we have, as we saw earlier, an approximate number of 45-ish that, that we're being told from the architects and the uh, CM firm is what it's required to, to kind of do that project. And it's okay. um, so my thought process would be next week is for the board to have one more conversation after we get a chance to kind of simmer and stew. Before we finalize the number that is that for an article or do we want to put the 45 in as a place for you? Go ahead. I was just going to say, should I review the timeline that we talked about? I forgot the full board. The full board wasn't with us when we were talking about that. So you're having a bond hearing on the 18th, which is the last day you really need to hold it. So it has to happen that day. Um, and the bond hearing is similar to a public hearing where you would ask for the public's input on applying for a bond. Um, that has to be posted in the newspaper for seven clear days before that, the 18th. And you have to get it to the newspaper published one or two days in advance of that. So that's why our timeline is extremely tight and we have to get those numbers in. So we can do an approximate um, number for the bond hearing. I think the number is pretty good right now for the for the first one, but the second one, we don't even have that number yet. And we, um, the, the construction manager needs this weekend to get that done. So it's really about when we can get that number for the rec center and how quickly we need to give it to the newspaper and have it published for seven days. So that's why there's a little bit of a timing issue um, that we need to get some more answers. So I would suggest that we publish two separate for the bond hearing, we, I would personally support publishing the bond hearing for the 45 million. Uh, the uh, building committee uh, voted to uh, recommend to the board that we move forward the design as it is at that amount. Um, and I don't think we're going to see a lot of fluctuations. You know, the construction manager and the architects are very comfortable with that $6 million contingency what have you. Um, and that amount posted does not need to be that dollar amount that needs to be both. So I think that for the sake of securing making sure all the I's are done seen across that we should publish that one um, sooner rather than later. And then we're gonna be down to the wire on the community 
Whenever we get the number from yeah. it. <laughs> you just need to publish immediately thereafter, but I don't want to risk. That's a great idea. We can do that. So, a great understanding of the time that Jeff just had. So, we're going to post. Well, hey, we need to agree on the number. The number. But if we agree on the number tonight, we post the, the 18th. And Monday, Tuesday, we can button up the rec center. And if there's any tweaks or changes that are you know, significant to the primary article we discussed tonight, but otherwise, we'll cover it there. We'll post the second with an additional blog here and put the timeline directly. And uh, we'll go live tomorrow. So it's two separate hearings. You can have it, you can hold it as oh, one, hearing. one hearing. So we'll get one published, and then as soon as we get the number, we'll get the other published. All right, so the question, is everybody okay with that course of action? So the big thing is, is obviously, is we've looked at the designs and the primary and the architect, and we have an idea of what they're thinking. They've done quite a bit of study work on what we need. And really what they're proposing to us is an addition with a dollar amount cost and four renovations in this existing space. So we're effectively creating about 110, 15,000, how many is that number, Jeff? Uh, 115,000. So, okay, 115,000 square feet of new educational space. Uh, so, the project, you know, it's, it's more than an addition. It's, it's 115,000 square feet of new educational space. Uh, so, it is a big project. It's going to be a big ask for the community, but I think, I think for us, that's really, that's what the community, I think, has been asking for. Um, and I think we need to give them an opportunity to speak. And so I think part of their opportunity is going to be much. So I certainly support that because that's what the rest of the world wants to do. And I think it's important to go back to your point that you brought up with the architecture here that. Fifteen million units to spend on this building. I'm excited to see their numbers, but you know, the group has eight to nine hundred thousand dollars. So we have a group failure that we have to tax. We don't have the money to cover that in our facility repair terms right now. I'm just curious to see what the fire alarm numbers come in. Um, the building's thirty years old, um, so well, forty-five million is a scary number. Really. Break up the contingency to solve that state level. Um, and that bond number doesn't include any potential building made from the state and the council. Money that isn't consumed in construction, but that there's money that isn't consumed, the money that's offset by the state building is money that's spent. So I mean, as the council said, unfortunately, you can't bond that. You have to bond for the big picture and then work. What is the year on this bond that we get? So I think it's pulled out $45 million. How does this work? There's two options. There's a 20 year bond or a 30 year bond. The rates on the 20 year bond are higher. Uh, rates on the 30 year bond are lower. Well, the repayment. The repayment is more than the interest, but your yearly payment is lower. So, like a on the 20 year bond in the 30th year, um, you're paying about $299. Thousand with evaluation. Um, the second year is always the highest, and you can pay for the eight hundred thousand. Do you know the third? It's a tax increase. What is that? Correct. For the thousand. For the thousand. On a thirty-year bond, um, you'd be paying a dollar ninety-five in the thirtieth year per thousand, um, or three sixty-two per thousand in the second year, which is the most expensive. Um, on a four hundred thousand dollar valuation, that works out for. $65 a month and $220 a month um, on $400,000 valuation. Or if you look at it, it's about $2 to, two to $4 a day. Um, so a cup of coffee for us. Um, 
what are the did you have a chance to talk to talk to this the firm about um, how often do towns pass this on the first? And I know that we can try it a couple of years and if it doesn't go then I like to think the cause of that it will. But this is a scary number like you said, so <laughs> Just a general statement. Uh, the subject matter experts tell us every year that they typically see prices rise on average about six percent every year. So if we took the numbers that they gave us today and then we push it out a year, we're already looking at approximately based on their track record a six percent increase in the prices that they've given us, even though we're estimates. If in fact uh, what they have shared is you know could be in if we wait a year or two years, you're then taking the estimated price or cost today and then adding 10% on it. So it's really in the community's best interest if we want to report on this because it's sooner rather than later. Yeah. Well, I agree with that, but, but how is, is this, are we confident that, and I guess I'm asking the, the committee, is this what we want to move forward on? I mean, versus taking out a component, versus shrinking it to make it palatable. Is this, is this what we need for this town, for this school? Yeah, so we talked with the, the committee, and the short answer is yes, it absolutely is. Could we pare this down and come up with a cheap version? Yeah, but is it going to create an educational environment that's correct for us kids, that's going to last us another, you know, grow with us for another 20 to 40 years? Um, the answer is no. Um, we could take a very sharp knife and whittle this down to the comparison. Short changing ourselves as a board and as a community the educational facility. And when, you, when we look at what we want our school to be, and we want it to be a modern 21st century educational facility, we're not there now. This is going to get in there. And I, I was shocked when you know, they first came out with the design, and how big they were. But then you started to figure in those details of. How education has changed. If you look at our classrooms, which are 30 by 30 CMU block spaces, that's not how we should be teaching kids these days. Um, and I think they've done a really nice job of trying to strike that, that balance. And yes, this is an expensive project, but it's, they tried to right size it the best they could for the year. Um, but there's no getting around the fact that it's an expensive undertaking. Um, I think the other thing to consider is one of the one of the things we, you know that could be looked at is don't renovate this space, build a new space, but you're still going to pour money into this space for the next 15 years if we don't just start, we don't just start correcting some of the issues. So, say 15 million, we spend 15 million, why not just fix it all at once and be done with it and, and put a you know 20 or 30 year buffer. Plus efficiencies in the mechanical systems. Um, it's creating, it, it really would be creating 115,000 square feet of new education space, which is huge. Um, what, what about the, uh, the idea of, um, of, you know, if you build it, they will come? Are we going to be creating this thing that's actually going to be attractive? If we're going to actually create this, you know, talk about building out of your field. And is this just going to be pulling more people into this town and you know sacrificing the rural character that is one of our strengths by making this big thing and spending all this money investing in it? I agree, it's an investment. And do our taxpayers want to invest in it? And is it going to create these sort of what are those sort of ramifications that might come from this kind of investment? I would conversely say it's like a wonderful problem to have. We've got people wanting to move here. We've got people in a great educational facility. So. I would hope that it would spur people wanting to live here. How amazing is that building a town that people want to be in because this school is so great. Um, and to that point, you know, there's a study that uh, LBA had provided us with, um, two different studies, but basically showing that communities that invest in their um, educational system typically see a 10% increase in property values. Um, another study out there shows that for every uh, dollar spent on uh, outside the area on public schools um, there's an increase in home value by 20 dollars um, 
So it's not just an investment in the school, but property value. Yeah, you're really Place, not because it's a only yeah. zoning has always been a as it currently sits, just because the lots are in front of But certainly to Jeff's point, it, it's an investment in the community, it's an investment in the future of our kids, it's an investment that the town has to start making. This town has not invested in itself since, frankly, since we built this building 30 years ago. There's been three generations of kids that have come to the, you know, it's time for this community to spend a little bit of money again on itself and invest in itself like our parents did if you grew up here or, or you know, if you've been in town long enough to know. You're in, you're, you're generational investments in the community. It's time for one of those to The point that I was going to make earlier is just uh, similar to standards. So, like we, we talked about the fire tank, like we had failed fire codes, right? Um, whether it's hardware or you know, whatever, it, it really fits into play. So the, the size of the building that's proposed, the types of classrooms and the locations are all based on you know, the now current standards. Um, so I kind of like liken it to the same thing. Like we're using an out of date end of life fire system, you know, in our we're trying to educate our kids in a place that Standards. I don't think okay on that. And I, so I, I, I guess what I might add is that there, don't get me wrong, because it, it could sound like we're just taking over 45, uh, that 45 number as an option and cavalier. There wasn't anybody who saw that number when it first got on bill and on the committee and didn't go. Woo. You know, but it, it, and but we had time to sit with the with the story of why it makes sense for us to really look at this as not just that number, and to really understand to, to break it out into components, the renovations alone that we would need to do, and and it's so hard because you can't see like unless you're in it, and I've been in it, I've lived it. So I know what it's like to walk in and see three kids and a teacher packed in something that used to be, and I, I think you might have remedied some of this now, but it, it's just like robbing Peter to, to pay Paul. You know, uh, the reason that we have the, the students out of storage areas needing for services is because, and we've, and we've got places to store things now. We keep piecing together. First, we put modulars out there because we had lack of space. If you look in the building, it wasn't built for storage. And now there are a lot more things that we have to use in order to educate. So, it, and it's changed. There are things in this that we just didn't use in the past. It's spaces and programming that we haven't used in, in the past um, that now are not like, it's not luxury. It's a requirement. Um, so for even screens from the ceiling for students who need them. We have trampolines for students who need them. There are other, there are things that twenty years ago didn't exist and now they're required. And so when we, when we look at it in that context and we we on the committee have had the time to sit with that story, that number becomes less of like sucking the air out of our lungs <laughs> um, to be more like, oh, okay. It really begins to make sense that we're building out for the, the future. Um, you know, the concept that we can have a big screen in a, in a, in a, a, a performance space and we can live stream an author in from, from a very popular children's book, very exciting. So, what I would say is, I would look for a motion from somebody to place a number in Article 1. So, I would make a motion that we place $45,500,000 in Article 1. For a second? Second. So, I have a motion by Jeff Kelly and second by Gigi. 
Article 1, 45, 5, Jeff? Yeah, um, 45, yes. 5. Additional discussion with that? Just the number? Or the so the language of the article is described by law, so we're just populating the number for the language of the article. Right, but then you still have to approve the article. Correct. I don't know. So I guess that's the motion to be approved. The motion is approving the article with 45 to 45. That's the number. I, I still have a question. Right. The question is, at the delivery session, can anything in here be changed? Or no? I don't believe so. It's like a teacher's contract. Yeah, you negotiate. This is the cost of this. Yes or no? We're the three fifths work. Three fifths is right. I, I mean, why is it three fifths? Just because it's so much. Yeah. yeah, it's all legal. Law. It, Dean went through the language, and then the bond council also has to approve the language of the article. Yeah, there's a bond council. There is. We have a bond council. It's all very prescribed. Um, and the idea of getting state aid is really still unknown at this point. So we've, we've pre applied. Pre-applied, but we can't submit the final application to have it scored until it's July first. July first is two. So Lavalley would work with us. Really, Lavalley would take the lead on producing the application. It is scored. There's a metric. Certain things will probably do fairly well on. There's certain aspects you may not do as well on based on the metrics that they use to score that. And then it depends on how much money there is and how many people are trying to get into the pot with money. And it could be a little, could be a lot, could be none, but you, you don't know. I was shocked when they said that only two people got money last year. Two. That's not good. No. But what if it was Allentown? Oh, and it was Allentown. And it was Allentown. Yeah. And, it, and they got a significant amount of money. And the other town got a sale, which, you know, you wouldn't typically think, you know, but they, as I understand it, had a parent call the state reps who were working hard to help deal with it. So, not state reps. All right, so, any additional questions? I'm going to pass out on this. Why am I? Why am I? There's always a chance. I'm not CPR certified anymore, so. Just pushing up with one idea. I don't know, but I think if we let it happen, uh, his wife will be looking for our heads. All right, so all in favor of Article 1 as written with 45.5, uh, 45.95,000. As I request a bond amount, what do I say? Aye. 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 Are you able to fit all those numbers in that page? You bet. All right. So why don't we just go ahead and review the standing articles just to make sure we're all on the same page. Is that suitable? All right. So Article 2 will be the one that we can't fill in yet. Correct. That would be for the uh, community center. That would be another bond article. Can you just real quick, just so the whole board's aware, the park fire thing go Oh, please. Um, yeah. So I met with Parks and Rec last night, um, talked to them about the project, um, and our desire to have them meet at Parks and Rec space. Um, they voted to support the concept, um, but there were a lot of granular details um, they were concerned about. Um, everything from building maintenance, you know, who's responsible for what, um, then also programming, um, and the ability, you know, to be able to use the space Monday through Friday. Two of them, they wanted to have you know, senior tango classes or um, whatever they might want to offer there. I couldn't answer those questions. Um, the, and then the other concern or want that they had was um, you know, a slight redesign of the space. They wanted more, um, you know, they wanted to offer cooking classes or things like that within that space. You know, it wasn't exactly what they have the perfect parts of rec building. Um, the discussion that you know we 
have talked of building many, many times within the hopefully they build in the design spaces, to keep trying to access those spaces. So we're building a very versatile building. Um, but the good news is they support it. Uh, Nick unfortunately wasn't able to be at the meeting, so we'll be able to share his input and kind of feedback with him on his running parks and rec. Yeah, so to those questions and to the fact that the vote is only three months away, is there a chance uh, it would be great to, to have to be on the same page and to have, you know, to have them supporting this. Um, is there a way for us to meet and maybe negotiate or kind of, I don't know, work out some of those details? I know, I don't know at this point you can't answer those questions, but is there a way for this board to meet with them and work out some of those questions so that going forward they so, project. I'm sure they'd be open to meeting with us. Um, the really, it's questions for us to answer, um, which would come down to I don't know who's going to answer it. It's a legal question, a liability question, but you know, are people allowed in the building during school hours if they you know, don't have quarry checks, you know, or can we just lock the doors and it's two separate buildings and we're fine? Insurance, we need to ask our insurance company, you know, what if somebody's going to a parks and rec program and it slips, falls, and breaks a leg and tries to sue? Um, go ahead. I think, I would, I think my, my thought process behind this when I, when I first proposed it is during the school day, in my mind, this is additional space for the school people. It's additional gymnasium space, it's additional, it's just space. We're doing some performances in the existing gym, it, it gives the uh, PE places to operate. And it's really those outside the school hours, which is where I see the team more of the parks and rec because that, that's in my head, right? Um, when school is in session at school, it's school. And when we're out of school, whether it's the summertime after school programs, the, 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 the summertime, uh, the kids club, what, 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 the parks and rec, yeah. summer, summer. Uh, for it's the after school program. It's the, the rec sports, it's the adult sports after hours type stuff, the adult, the adult activities after hours. I think that's really when I see that being the parks and rec sports. I'm seeing in my head from you know, 8 to 3, whatever time it is, it's really additional space to school utilizes. And that's what allows the school to support the operations of it. And then basically, we, we incur the operational costs. Parks and Rec utilizes it for their program outside of our school. That, that's what I see in my head. And it, it, it kind of serves a benefit for the students, it serves a benefit for the school, and it continues to serve a benefit for the community outside of the school. But to your the idea, I mean, if we're trying to get this to be a community project, then to have community access to it, Makes sense, and so I, the idea of having a dance class or whatever during the day when there's no other places to meet, you know, I think that that might be a great idea. So then that's logistics. Kind of thing. And that's my question: is How do we work that out in the next three work? And three, is there a way to work that out so that we can actually agree on something before it's over? Yeah, that was my concern in talking to Parks and Rec, and trying not to speak on the before the board. They had those questions. If we build a space, they're going to use the gym now, right? They're going to use the gym. They're using the gym right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they're in it. Sure. Yeah. So, so, to me, it, it's, it's a two tier thing. We build it, we know it's going to be used. It's way more convenient for after school programming. It's get up, use the ridership. There, there's all kinds of conveniences to have. The question is, what do we. So, so my concern is not that we build it parts of my concern is that we go into this with the right mindset of building something that how inclusive do we want it to be for the community. And that's what we really need to flesh out, right? Because it's it's going to be so that much I have zero concern. The question is how it's used and how we envision envisioning it being used. And when do we make 
when and how do we make those decisions, right? There's the legal and technical questions, and then there's the uh, programming question. Yeah, the, it's the bigger philosophical question. The legal and technical side of it, really, the utilization is similar to the utilization that is now. We allow parks and rec to use our facility in our space. So the, the, the legal technical side is, is really no different. Parks and rec utilizes existing space. So then it's just the, how do they utilize it? And they're, they're utilizing it for salsa class on Tuesday at 9.15, or are they utilizing it for salsa class on Tuesday at 4.30? And that's, I think, a big portion of what they're trying to hash out is what it sounds like. Right, Jeff? Yeah, but also they have some logistical challenges because, you know, are they going to, so in your scenario, it would require them to would be white space as well for offices and operations, right? This would basically be a salary. Not necessarily. My 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 mentality when I proposed this, this is just me when I saw when this came to light to me on the plan we're looking at, at the, the different renditions rendi was A, this community can benefit from additional athletic space, community space, a big open space, right? Parks and Rec needs better space that's not next to the jail to house our students after school, right? I mean, flat out, we can all agree on that. The George B. White building is not an ideal solution or an ideal location for an after school program. This facility could be, should be, given we have a space in suitable for it. We also know that Parks and Rec utilizes this facility every day to a certain extent. So create a space that they can utilize in the same hours they're utilizing it, but it becomes their space if it's a benefit for parks and rec and do it. All of the, the youth sports that are not the school sports can now operate and they can operate at the same time as the school sport. So we're not competing for gym time. It allows our teams to have more reps. It allows parks and recs programs to have more reps. It allows them to coincide and run at the same time. We can put offices in there. Parks and rec can have them, certainly. In terms of base their offices out of that facility. But I also think that there's a benefit to us for doing performances inside the auditorium to be able to set it up for a week. Have a performance space. Set it up and have school wide meeting spaces. And still be able to hold and function PE classes independent of whether anything else inside that space. So it's a, it's a twofold thing in my mind. I was broke. Um, I moved that we form a subcommittee to um, meet with Parks and Rec to uh, discuss various concerns and to um, reach an agreement um, about how this building can be used to our mutual benefit. I don't know if there's any. I would just. I would. Thank you. So is, is that a necessity of another subject, or is that something the existing building committee whose task is to make this is working? I could go either way. I don't really care that much. But this, we, we're not. We're talking around each other, and we're not going to talk to you. I think that I think that if we can have the rec on board with this project, I think we're going to have a, a lot of the lots of support. So, and that would be really great. I would so certainly be comfortable comfortable charging the building committee. I'm also cognizant of the time they've already put into this, and if it makes sense to take a break from that. I don't know, but it seems like there's a, there's a potential for a lot of support. And I hear what you're saying, and you're right, but at the same time, if, if this is, this is a, this, that's a big price tag we just started. So we're going to get more support from the town by doing this. I think I would be okay compromising for a five year window or something like that. You know, we will make it a primarily rec unused space. And I don't know how we're going to do that, but, but I don't think right now we're going to do that. I agree with you, we're not going to get all the details uh, in this topic. I don't know if we're talking about either. I don't want it to be school only, and they can only use it like in the AM or the PM because they're the folks in town who are going to be paying taxes, who or maybe, maybe they've got uh, idle time in the middle of the day, and they could be something in that free space. So 
I look at it like a logistical and scheduling nightmare, but I think that that would benefit the community the most. So if Parks and Rec wants to offer dancing at 11 in the morning, the people who are going to come to that have availability. They won't do that at that time. And if at 2 p.m. there needs to be a uh, school-wide meeting, you know, then those are just kind of the, the unfortunate logistics that need to be sorted so that everybody can benefit from space. So, so I am I am comfortable. <coughs> it sounds like Nate wants to take the take, take the mantle of this one. So I'd be comfortable to just you know, request Nate and Dave at the Parks and Rec and kind of further down the conversation with Jeff Stafford and see where it goes and then that can talk to you. I don't know if you need a subcommittee for that, if it's just somebody has to take time to continue the conversation. He is. Yes. But does there need to be some sort of an actual agreement? I don't know if that. I think it starts with a conversation. Yeah, I mean, that, that, and that's what I was going to, you know. If you, I can't imagine that Parks and Rec is going to hinge their support on whether <laughs> they can have a 9 a.m. salsa class. Like, give me a 9 a.m. salsa class, I'll get some time with Rec Center. You know, I think we have to stay somewhat at 30,000 feet. Like, okay, these are the things we're envisioning. But until this is a reality and we figure out what's going on in the building and what the key cards and the keys look, I can't imagine we can work out that level of detail to that, you know. So to that point, though, specificity. My, my concern yesterday when they started bringing these things up was I don't want to sell them false bill of goods. Right. And they were asking me questions that I wasn't comfortable answering. Right. And it's like, I don't want to say anything that's going to garner their support when it's not our true intention. Right. Um, and, and that's my concern. I agree with you. We're at a very early stage, we still have to get to March. But a general, whether it's a letter of understanding, with um, on, on the very 30,000 foot view of what it would look like, but to make sure that all eyes are open um, and what next. Well, I mean, other times, I think that, um, you know, I, I think the thing that concern me is when you said you met with them and that they they have been thinking about what space for them to look like and thinking about asking in the future for space that would meet their programmatic needs and so because of that I guess I felt like yes uh, I, I, I think having them at least in conversation to kind of hear what is their vision and can and can does does their vision match the, the proposed space? Um, I I do hear you. I do think like we're way up here, and and they will use the space because if it, it, it comes to fruition, because that's the space. The space now. And, yeah. But on the other hand, I I also think out of you know. Um, you know, in the in the community mindedness of it. I mean, I I, I, I saw one of the, the members of the commission here tonight to listen to the presentation. So, you know, I think that it probably makes sense for us to at least get go back again for another conversation, so that there is no like eh. That's not what they yeah. Even if it is a list of here's what we can do, right? And here's what areas remain unresolved, but have you know have that discussion and just bullet point it out. We know sitting here now we can all say, yep, yeah, they're gonna use the space after school, they're gonna use the summer camp, they're gonna use it for week of athletics and night down athletics, right? Questions are during daytime use, during school hour use, and office space. Right? So what what are the what are the wants that they have that we can't say yes to right now without having further discussion? So I think if we could get that answer, or at least on paper. So, so I'm comfortable requesting the page chat. Nate looks like he wants to So then, So then my next step would be that I would maybe I'll just talk to you Jeff pretty much immediately and I would make a detailed list of what you just said basically and I'll come back to our meeting on Tuesday when we were there today. Monday, Tuesday, on and can I can I just sort of give that list to the board and say can we agree that this is something that we can commit to? Yeah. 
terms of school or thing. When we play, we're planning this building, and we're going to be playing this building for the next two years. So if we commit to that as a priority, then that's going to be the plan. We can commit to that. We're the players. Right. Is that a fair statement? So then, Jeff, I just talked to you briefly later. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Commitment that we can make. And then I can, once we approve it as a board, then I'll think I have to. Can I mention a safety issue? It's all, there's things that we'll end up discussing. Discussing the process. All right. Is that one? Sure. Yeah. You just did it. You just did it. I just did it. Well, my second is to do it. I can draw. I think it was withdrawn. I can draw. 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 I can our vote in this case would just be to reaffirm the It's already, you don't have to. It's already done. Yeah, that one's done because it was the MEC's budget at that point. Uh, I did not record the MEC's vote. I think it was 5 3. 5 3. Was three there was three no's and it was, yeah, I think it was 5 3. I think Mrs. Whitty told me 5 3. Last night's vote. 5 3. It was 5 3. Okay. And Historically, the MBC has re voted on articles after the public hearing. So, whatever. Next week. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Article 4 uh, will be shall. I'm going to read this because this is what they uh, will be kind of resolved. Shall the Article 4 reads, shall the Deerfield School District, Article 1 fails, vote to raise an appropriate the sum of $250,000 from June 30th, 2022, and sign the funding balance, available for transfer on July 1st, 2022, for the purpose of the school building repair at Deerfield Community School. No amount will be raised from taxation from this Article is contingent upon the failure of Article 1. Article 1 passes, the more article shall not take effect. So that would be in the event that the expansion project fails, requesting the town provide us with an additional two hundred fifty thousand dollars to start making the most immediate repairs. And you did vote on that one. We voted on that. Five vote. Anybody wish to discuss, change, or amend? I would like to discuss amending that. Okay. Uh, let's discuss it in light of the potential for costs. Uh, that so that's the two hundred fifty thousand. I think that we currently I don't have my budget monitor this thing. Do we know roughly what's that for us? Three forty three. Um, so we've got, and we still have to fund the fire alarm panel. We've got the fire alarm panel, which is has not funded yet. Correct. So, yeah, I'd say so. Big ticket items we're looking at that are going to hurt bad if we have a failure in our roof at the twelve hundred thousand. We've got our mechanical system, which we have to replace, is going to be a million two. Um, and then the fire alarm, so that puts us at 2 1, 2 4. Um, I think, you know, we've seen that 436 or what we said, uh, in that trust fund, it felt like we were pretty safe, but seeing the, you know, what things are actually costing these days, um, I, I think we may want to consider looking to be appropriate more than the 250,000. So, uh, 
Well, so what that does is that draws off of the, the fund balance of the tip of the return. That's how, how it's currently run. So, it, right, it's, it's tax money. And it's whether it's money we've already collected and not get back or money we're raising. Yes. That being said, if you change that number, regardless of what the number is, you can only fund it up to the amount of surplus. So, even at 200000 if we only have 100000 dollars surplus, Correct. So you're limited by the amount of your surplus on any given year, which we'll probably look too early in the year to start gaining that number. But that being said, you could you could raise the amount subject to having a surplus to cover it, or you could raise the amount and you raise it from taxation. So it would be in addition to and then any surplus from this year would then be returned to taxpayers. Potentially you would raise it. It's all it's all the people's money. Absolutely. What 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 hole do you take it from? How do you take it? I guess my feeling is that when I know when I have a big mental process that goes on and say you know not raise the taxation, it's going to be surplus versus all well, that's the case as well. It's always taxation. The question I think the first sure, question is arithmetic people play into that box when they're making choices. But so from a dollar amount standpoint, what are you thinking is the number you're comfortable with? You know, if we look at, if we had our roof evaluated five years ago, I don't know what the lifespan stage was, you know, expected life expectancy, but let's say, you know, we should start planning five years out that we're going to be, you know, we made five years with this roof, great, if not, how are we going to pay to replace that roof? If we have a mechanical system, how are we going to pay that? So I don't know the exact amount, but we need to, I think, start building that fund. If Article 1 doesn't pass, we need to start getting that fund up there in preparation for it. So, what's your dollar amount? We're going to let's discuss it. 350. So, if we do 350 over the next four years, that'll be 1.4. You know, and, and who knows what the next four will do, but that's on the next four. What do we have? No, we don't know what we have in several. No, we typically don't start talking about that until April. It is a default year, so that means you know it's pretty tight, and we anticipate a lot of surplus. Well, I mean, you know, it, the big swings can be in like special ed and high school tuition, so that, we need to take a look at those because you, know, you may have more. Sometimes it surprises us. But until you start closing lines, it's tough to. But I think over the next three months, we're going to be ideally making a really strong case as to how this building's falling apart. I mean, we, you know, so if we don't ask for something substantial, if it fails, I think we should be because we're going to be sending a message that we need to update our, our infrastructure. Yeah. So maybe we would be able to go bigger than 250 and perhaps more fast and if we make a good enough case. And if we ask for. Four hundred, and we get three hundred thousand in surplus. Then we will be funding for three hundred thousand, correct? Correct. And I would propose that we raise that line up to four hundred thousand. Do we have a second? Okay. Motion by Jeff, and a second by GG to amend Article Four to the sum of four hundred thousand. Uh, Jeff, is your intent to leave it from surplus? Yes. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we're going to amend that to 400. Okay. Article 5, show the Deerfield School District. Article 1 passes. Votes discontinue the school facilities repair and improvement expendable trust fund created in March of 2011. Said funds with the accumulated interest to be able to withdraw and be transferred to the district's general fund. This article is contingent upon the passing of Article 1. If Article 1 fails, this one article should not take effect. The majority vote required. This would dissolve the uh, facilities repair and improvement expenditure trust. In the event the article passes, we would then move those funds to the general fund. Once we move into the general fund, it would be the Right. 
Got it? So, just to clarify real quick, we cannot reduce that to a dollar amount, correct? We either have to dissolve it. We would have to dissolve it and then reestablish it. Correct. To not money it. So we could in subsequent years seek to reestablish the fund and fund it with a thousand dollars to open the fund. It's required to be this over the So because there's a plenty of burden to establish a fund, um, we could reopen the fund in a couple of years if necessary. It shouldn't be, but if necessary, we could just reopen the fund. So but this would be to dissolve the fund and take over the money and say, put it in the general fund. So, if our one passes, let's talk to them. We're going to have all new finishes, mechanical systems. Conceivably, everything's going to be under warranty. So, if something did fail, it's not going to be any money. We should have acquired a fairly sized equipment. But let's talk about things that we don't know yet because the scope of work is still being defined. Let's say there was a pump station failure. We're not sure if we're putting the entire pump station. Can you talk about the timing for this? So, so the vote, let's say the vote for um, the bond pass of the mark come June 30th, then this would go away. Look at the class. Then this would go away, right? July 1st, we do have access to the bond. Well, I don't know how you pull. Can you just pull, go to the bank and pull out? <laughs> how does that work? It's, it's what I do. Around August, you can start withdrawing. You, you can start withdrawing. Yeah. So, I guess if the, the roof fails in August, Right? We just gave up. We just returned all of this money. Mm -hmm. If the roof fails in August, we would be able to access that money, even as though as long as that was part of the project. As long as it was part of the project, which the roof is part of. It. Yes. Yeah. And the mechanical systems are part of the project. We are in the timeline for construction. If this part passes in March, they're going to jump into plan design mode. Um, but things won't go to bid until. Um, so, for, for realistically, construction starts in the summer of 2023. Okay, so June 23rd is as soon as that contract is going to be on site. So, we've got a year and a half. Or, it's in June 30th, 2022, to June 30th, 2023. Yeah, now we can access the funds. We've got a, basically a one month window of, okay, let's hold up with grace in July, but payment terms in at 30, so we'd be comfortable, I assume. I don't want to say that. But we'd also be at the beginning of our new operating plan. So we could, if something, we could take money out of the operating plan. Until we have access to the plan. Until we have until we can access to the plan. Until we can access to the plan. And if, the roof, and if the roof falls in and we don't have access to the bond, right. we're going to have to pay for it. Right. So we would have to come to the upper. And, and I don't, anything that you do, the contractors, I'm going to say you owe me 300000 on July 15th. Yes. Right. So. so I'm not worried about what you're to protect yourself. So I'm not worried about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but just to make sure we thought our own cross our T's, so things that aren't going to be included in the project. It's so uncomfortable with it. To an extent, I think it's so little air reputation. All so, the other, so the other, the other option is to strike Article Six this year and put the same language on next year. Let the money stew for one year, as it sits. Leave it as your insurance policy until you really get into the depth of the project. Would that change anybody's vote? I don't. What is their vote? Would could the argument be made that that money would be guaranteed to help pay the first bond payment? This year or no? Well, the first bond payment would be due in 2023. So, I mean, that, that would, it would effectively just offset a portion of bond. That was that we couldn't repurpose the money. No, you're, you're guaranteed, if you discontinue this, you're guaranteeing that that 343000 goes back to the taxpayers. It's a guarantee. That's the intent. I see what you're saying. It's the, the reason we put this in here was to show the taxpayers that we can solve the county. Trying to yes. give money back on it. It was very expensive to take. 
ultimately it's like 346 against 45 million. The gesture is there, but it's not going to change anyone's calculus. So if you if you strike that article and you just wait 12 months, we put it back next year. You're 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 in the throes of the project at that point, and you had anything that has identified itself as being a pressing matter will have had ample opportunity to be put in by contractors that have been on the site that have been looking for issues. And then the next year is all for fun once we've really got cracked. Could we say in the delivery session that we anticipate our plan next year is to well, but you're obligating we can't because I, I think technically we're obligating a future board granted for the board members of the same Most what, either. Yeah. right? But I'm saying, but but it technically it's a new board from March, yeah. So we can't obligate the next board. I think that looking at it from the Let's protect and take care of the school picture and not the optics of who you want to money back. I think the prudent thing is to keep the money in that trust fund this year and get rid of that wire. So, is the is wish of the board to strike part of this? Aye. 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 So, we're striking Article 5. Do we need a motion? It's we didn't take any vote on it. Okay, so Article 5 is gone. Okay, yeah. So Article 6, which presumably is about to become Article 5. Okay, so we shot the Dickfield School District. If Article 1 passes, vote to discontinue the school facility paving expendable trust fund created in March 2014. Said funds would accumulate accumulated interest to date and withdrawal are to be transferred to the district's general fund. Most contention on the passage of Article 1. Article 1 fails, this one article should not take effect, majority vote required. So this is essentially the same conversation we just had, but we're not concerned as George much about the paving of the building. This would be the gesture with that, this would be a gesture. Yeah, it's, uh, what's it, what's it? 73,000. 73,000. Oh, that is, uh... What? No, I'm just, like, it is a gesture, but... It is a So. Uh, but that would be, again, that fund would no longer be necessary. The other thing that does is it allows us to uh, design a proper uh, payment plan in the upper one. Yeah. All right, so uh, I look for a motion. For I think you did all this now. Uh, we were zero, zero, zero. We said, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Anybody wish to change your vote on that? Well, but the Article 1 said five years ago, we did not vote on Article 1. Well, we'll on. Exactly. Okay. Uh, it was the language in the yeah, uh, said yeah. that pending with uh, the number. The number. Oh, yeah. okay. All right, back to Article 6. Anybody wish to change your vote on Article 6? Okay, so if we can amend it, I did uh, inform the NBC that once we had a uh, Work done on the uh, articles. Okay. Um, we would send them over to the chairman. So, so it's okay with the board if we send those to the NBC as soon as we have them edited. The final look at them. Yeah. 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 Okay. Including number three. Or no, number three two. is to be determined, and we can just denote that number three is still in there. Number two. I'm sorry, number, number two. two is still in there. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay. Putting the bonds above the budget is messing with my head. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, anything else regarding uh, questions, comments regarding the Warren articles? All right. All right. Uh, the mask discussion. So we did agree as a board to rediscuss or readdress the current mask policy at this meeting. Um, I do believe Patty has a matrix for us. Are we part the conversation? I believe everybody has all. And then, uh, any additional information? That you, um, the only thing I don't have in front of me that just occurred to me and they want is the, the, the language of the motion. Do, do people want to know what your motion was? Can you look that up, Trish? You, you looked it up last time, I think. The motion that they made um, to re look at the mask. Oh, okay. Do you know what it 
got it. Okay, great. That would be great. I think that just might help to hear. Okay, so the main thing is September. Last meeting in September? September. So I was um, able to um, update the matrix um, midday today, and the county and Deerfield data are still considered substantial um, spread that would, um, following this matrix, require universal masking. Um, Rockingham County is substan substantial transmission. Deerfield active cases when I looked was 18. Deerfield Community School number was zero and percent of uh, population fully vaccinated is 53.9. Uh, the last page, the PCR test positivity rate over seven days is 18.4% and the number of new infections per 100,000 is 645. That was so, Jeff, did you, uh, so I certainly understand that there's a desire in the community for a change in the current protocol. And also, I'm not entirely convinced that today is the correct moment. I did ask Patty and the question to the staff and kind of get an opinion from them. Is that something you information you share with us? So why don't we uh, start with that? So I put out a super simple survey with two questions on it, whether to continue mask wearing um, or to uh, have a mask optional. 83.5% um, of the staff felt that it was important to continue wearing masks in school, and 16.5% said that they felt that staff and students should um, wear masks well, uh, should have the option to wear masks. Um, I did give uh, an option to comment as well, um, and received several comments um, that basically supported their answers, both for yes and for no. Um, we have some, some staff members who felt that um, it was important that even though our cases are low in school, uh, we are at an all-time high with the variant and all the travel. Um, you know, there's some, a lot of staff members that are double masking right now just to keep to stay safe. Um, and, and, then, and then we do have some people who felt like it, at this point they would like their students to be able to see their face and be able to see their students' faces. So. Uh, at this point, that is what the staff is waiting for. Um, we do have an update from Nurse Bonnie as well. Uh, she was on a call with Dr. Chan. I did ask her to specifically focus, see if Dr. Chan had any information regarding the vaccinated of our littles from the five to 12 year, year olds. Um, she said that because they haven't had a call since December, that um, there were a lot of updates and Dr. Chan really didn't get the chance to answer anything. The only thing he spoke about was um, students being vaccinated, five to one year olds, students being va vaccinated is just to continue to um, reiterate and encourage vaccination and boosters for the eligible groups. Um, and didn't really have much more to say about that. I will add um, that it's, it's we, we have had some students who are vaccinated. I think Mr. Green can speak to this. He has um, student children in that age range. But it has been extremely difficult for our, our families to get their kids vaccinated during a lot of time. In November and December, we had a huge number of cases in town in our school. Kids can't really get vaccinated with that exposure or any symptoms. Um, it was, it's been challenging to get an appointment um, for them to get vaccinated. We don't really have a can't ask parents to provide proof of vaccination, so we don't have a good feel for the number of students who are or are not vaccinated. Of course, kindergartners can't wait to tell you that they got vaccinated because they're just open books. But um, so I, 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 that's really all I have to say to weigh in on that. Um, but Dr. Chan did speak a lot about the CDC's current guidance in terms of shortening the quarantine period of time. 
Um, and I believe that the state of New Hampshire, you know, we've got information from the Department of Education stating that they are weighing all of that information before they, um, before they, or the New Hampshire Department of Health and Services, before they say whether they're, you know, before they weigh in on what they're, what they're suggesting to have happen. Um, but, but Dr. Chan did feel that they were probably going to go, going to go along with the quarantine guidance down from 10 days, from 10 days down to five days. But with you know all of the stipulations in place, that there you, you're, you know, you're getting your symptoms unapproved, and you have to stay masked for the initial five days, and um, so that is something that is we'll probably get some more information about in the next couple of days. Um, so I, I that's that's the information I have. What questions? Do you have? Yeah, and it was a little bit, it was not super clean. Uh, I think that was a problem last night. But, um, but uh, it's Oxnard and Emotion, second by GP, requiring masks in your book school until a vaccine becomes available to children of age 12. Then there was a motion that was approved uh, for an amendment um, to change the language to 5 to 11 years old and add if the vaccine does not pass or there are vaccine does not pass, or there are changes to the NHDHHS guidelines that the board will revisit the mask mandate as of that January 3rd. Uh, and so the first part of the motion says we will wear fire masks until the vaccine becomes available. So, and then we actually later have updated the line because it was until. Uh, five to seven, five to eleven years old have just to become fully vaccinated, not that the vaccine was available. So when they became fully vaccinated was late December, I think, right? Except for those who couldn't get vaccinated. And then we added um, that if the guidelines change for the DHHS, then we can What date are those These minutes that I'm looking at are from the 10 20. But they're in the substantive folder, which is 11 3. So, 11 3 meeting, we revisit the 10 20 minutes. Plus, with the 10 20 minutes. So, I think the first question that we really need to kind of discuss is right out of the gate, is there an interest in amending the current policy as it stands? I'm interested in extending the policy. So if we, I interpret what I think I, we said last time is that that expired. If the policy of wearing masks expired you know, a couple weeks ago, except for the kids who can't get vaccinated. So if we're trying to incorporate all of the children from 5 to 11 to be able to give them a chance to come for vaccinated, then that would we would interpret that to say, well, well as far as we know, they have not all had a chance to get vaccinated. But the guy decided that it's different. I just need some clarification. We actually are not. We don't know the vaccination status of our students. So that. So the decision is based on the fact there's been an opportunity. Yes. For students. Right. And whether or not they're vaccinated is at this point not something we're privy to because the state has not declared that to be a required vaccine. Required vaccine. In the event the state goes down that path, well, then you know, there are certain chances that people can get there by the state. Although some districts in other states I know of are not requiring. The New Hampshire passed specifically so we can You're not requiring, but right. you, is there a law? Oh, okay. That's what I mean. Why, you, Family, families can volunteer the information, but we can't require it. Okay. Any okay. And the only reason that I'm asking is because I know that other states have said if. For instance, there are districts in Massachusetts who have met the threshold who had in the past. I think that the Omicron variant is probably making a change in their policy, but initially, if they had met an 80% threshold, 80%, and this was about high school students who were vaccinated, then they uh, were able to be, uh, have a mask optional. So I can be 
Absolutely. So the, um, I pulled the technical ed, ed, um, assistance that came from the Department of Education because there is a legal, legal reference in New Hampshire, and um, one of the questions on the document was, may a school require that students who have not received a vaccine wear a mask when others are not required to do so, or that they occupy different physical spaces than vaccinated students? The answer from the Department of Education is no. Mm -hmm. Tethering specific privileges to vaccination status, such as not wearing a mask or granting access to specific areas of the building is functionally the same as requiring the vaccination for attendance. It is a backdoor mechanism for exercising the authority that the legislature has retained for itself and for DHHS, namely requiring what vaccinations are required for school attendance. You have a copy of that. Yeah, I, I read it. Oh, good. Yeah. I did read it. What I, I, it's still, to me, in my mind, doesn't, it, it, it's neither here nor there. I probably, it, I, I'm just saying that. So you could uh, ask people if their children have been vaccinated and they can offer up that information. Yes. And, and so then you would have a sense of what percent of the children in our school will be vaccinated. Personally, I probably agree with Nate and what Zach said earlier that looking at everything that I, I have been able to find and read about pediatric cases of um, COVID-19. And yes, it's been mild. I have read that there are mild cases, but because the spread is so wide and so many children are getting COVID, that that will simply mathematically raise the numbers of children that are hospitalized, hospitalizations have increased for pediatric 35%. Um, and so, um, because, because of the contagiousness of the new variant, I, it doesn't seem to me that we say, okay, everybody has an option now for wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. Everything that I have been reading and trying to look at the science space that, and, and I have found articles, the CDC actually published a study that talked about that schools that mask have a lower incidence of spread and schools that haven't masked have a much higher incidence of spread of COVID. Um, and it's, Right on the CDC website. Right. Yeah, I, I would like to just point out because that's something we hear during public comments a lot, and I, I think it's important to note that you know the CDC it, it's it's significant. I mean, it, it's 16.32 per 100,000 cases for schools with mass communities versus 34 students per 100,000. So I mean, it's statistically significant. Um, and there's numerous articles for anyone to Google, you know, do schools and mass communities have lower rates of COVID, you know, and then, you know, I, I try to search for things as unbiased as I can. Um, you know, I'm going to get the information in a different way. Um, and what I see is that schools and mass communities do have lower dependents. Um, you know, somebody had asked for us to provide the metric on, on, on when and when it's the right time and what we're looking for. I, and I don't have the answer to that question. I, I wish I did. I know that we're coming towards the end of it, but this surge is troublesome, and, and I wish we were to do a victory lap and, and that we made open the but I don't think we have. I think we're, we're in the winter. Um, but I would like to go back to providing a metric by which we can look at and say this is the light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm not comfortable being a layperson when it comes to health and science, but I am comfortable going to the Department of Health and Human Services guidelines. So I would make a motion that we adopt the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services masking matrix based on our talent data assessment of the most recently available data on the state of New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services COVID-19 website. It shall be done on each Friday Parents being notified of the upcoming week's mask requirement by the end of day Friday. If during any week, if during any weekday the school, if 
during any week the school is in a mask optional scenario in cases rise to a level where masking is suggested that make it mandatory. Staff shall notify families via one call now, and masks shall be required the following day until the end of that week, where a new assessment of the data will be done for the outcome. No. Please. <laughs> You're going to do it anyway. I am. <laughs> I trust that you look. Um, when you talked about the DHHS matrix, are you talking about the one that we were following that I've included in all of your updates because they took it out of the last update? So they're no longer providing that matrix? They provided it and then they, when they did their newest update, this it's just not in there. Um, so I just want to make sure that we understand what we're using and what I provide to you is what they put in their first back to school toolkit. I just want to make so sure that that's what you're referring to. I am referencing. DHHS okay, perfect. And you you said using um, town, local, town, town level data. Correct. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure we're oh, there. Sorry. That's the all right. So there was a motion. We didn't take. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion and a second. So discussion regarding just motion. Do we want to? So I will, I'll add for commentary say, and a, a significant source of frustration of mine has been the attitude that I've heard in the community from certain families who have boasted about sending their children to school asymptomatic, knowing their children are asymptomatic. Yes, positive but asymptomatic. And so this is a small town. You go and you tell your neighbors and you tell your friends and you think that it's not going to circle back to other people it does. And there are people in this community that have been very proud of sending Kids to school be symptomatic because they think it's a cold or a flu. And I have the desire to get the kids out of mass. I haven't liked it all along, but I also know that if we can't trust the adults to act like adults, then we have to make sometimes decisions that aren't going to be popular because we can't trust some of the adults to do the right thing. And that's where I'm kind of stuck. I felt like the community was following the guidance and doing their part, it would be much easier for me to place a significant amount of faith in the community to say, everybody here is doing what they can do, they know they're doing it, and, you know, let's, let's get through this together. But this, what I'm hearing and, 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 and where I'm hearing it from is disheartening because it's, it's perpetuating. It's the people of the community want to believe so that we're going to cause them this one. Go ahead. All right. So, I'll read this book. Thank you. To adopt the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services mask matrix based on our town mobile data. Assessment of the most recently available data on the state of New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services COVID 19 website shall be done on each Friday with parents being notified of the upcoming week's mask requirement by the end of day Friday. If during any week the school is in a mask optional scenario and cases rise to a level where masking is suggested by the matrix to be mandatory, staff shall notify families via one call now, and masks shall be required the following day until the end of that week, where a new assessment of the data will be done for the upcoming week. And to just further theory, I made that function. The concern had been that we were going to be switching back from masks on, masks off. I think what we saw in the last this school year is that we have cases, we have cases, and they, we haven't seen them. So I'm not terribly concerned about the, oh, masks on Tuesday, no masks on Wednesday, that type of thing. But this prevents that. So we're in one week, lots of time. We look at the administration looks at the data on Friday. If we 
are in parallel with the nature X says we should be mass is optional. Notice goes out. If cases rise on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a long call now that here it is now in substantial and mass is there. It's the only metric that we have that's been put out by the state that we can base off of and decide our own opinions. Um, I think that it gives us a goal as a community and as a school in the light of the end of the tunnel. Um, and if we are over the hill and COVID done, then great, we'll be out of masks next week. Um, well, we have. So, based on that, and I want to make sure you're looking at this chart and reading it the same way that I necessarily am. So, based on that chart, when we look at cases within schools, at the moment there is zero. Correct? Correct. So, based on that chart, what would the masking status be according to your motion? It's based on Deerfield level data. Well, when I look at this chart, I see cases within schools, sporadic cases. Oh, understand. Okay. So it's tied to the school guy. Right, right. So that's why I'm at. This is where I want clarification. So, so, so I would say that we look at two things when we're making the decision on Friday or the administration. Yeah. Um, Deerfield. Are we at minimal, moderate, or substantial? Let's say we're at moderate. Excellent. Let's say we have. Two sporadic cases without evidence of facility transmission. That's the option. Okay, but when you say Deerfield, the level of Deerfield transmission, Deerfield, Deerfield then is such a substantial. Right now, yes. But we're saying case, are you looking at the cases within schools or is, is, is your first line the level of Deerfield transmission? Can I just one minute? No. Right, so level of your field transmission. Yes. So where is your number to the level of your field transmission? I'm not the DHHS website. So DHHS's website says in your field, it is uh, level of transmission. Uh, we have it for Rockingham County. They don't show your field. Deerfield is just 18 cases with. No, Deerfield is at 645. So okay. I think we figured out if to get below that threshold, it's four, four cases in the town. So, so to your motion, any number greater than 4.5, it's Deerfield. Any greater, any number greater than 4.5 cases in town, puts Deerfield at a substantial rate of transmission, which means that the mass is Correct. Right. Correct. So until Deerfield drops below 4.5, basically below 5, before we revisit it, before we revisit it, masks are going to be required because Deerfield is in a substantial state. I would. Or, or is your intent to look at the school level data independent from the Deerfield data and say there is zero cases within the school, it's optional. There's sporadic cases without evidence of facility transmission, it's optional. Um, there's a single cluster you're targeting, there's multiple large outbreaks, you're universal. No, that is not my intent. Because I will say that my issue in the past with the state's data, or with, or with the rate of transmissions, in, in that per 100,000, Deerfield, rural New Hampshire, rural Iowa, four and a half cases here spread out over 60 square miles is much different than four and a half cases in the same floor of the same building in New York City spread is going to occur more rapidly in certain environments and because the, that data doesn't compensate population density it's very difficult for me to reconcile how that data affects the population density because is it is the data intended to stop spreading in New York City? Or is it intended to stop spreading in rural Iowa where those four and a half cases are coming out of the one house on the middle of a thousand acre field? So I, I don't disagree with you. Um, it comes down to, 
I don't want to play scientist. I agree with you that right now, what we're in, whatever series we are in, um, I, I agree that for 100,000, we're not, you know, it's not a blanket statement. And so, Open to an amendment. If there was five cases in Deerfield and none of the school, and, you know, I, I don't know a lot of people that were in the hospital right now. I would feel differently about it. But that's a motion and not science. And this is the only science group bit, science group bit that they've given us. So, so I guess what I'm trying to root out is where is the direction for the administration? Is the direction for the administration to check on Friday at seven or wearing masks? even though there's been no cases in DCS for a period of time. And I'm only trying to root through the questions that you know we're going to get. Yeah. So I'd say we can put an amendment on it to put a, you know, a point at which we want to review and have this discussion again. So I'm not opposed to amendments, but I think this is a good starting point for us. And if anyone wants to make an amendment, you can feel free with it. It's how we calculate, you know, Someone wants to figure out a different way to calculate our transmission rates that they're comfortable with. But. So we know what. Uh, sorry, can I just say go ahead. Six, To your point, the test positivity rate, I think we're going to see, looking at it objectively, we're going to see it skewed because I know people now who are taking at home tests, they're positive and they're born. They're not getting PCR tests. They're the adults doing the right thing. Yeah, or people get the positive at home. Oh no, I gotta be at work tomorrow. I'm gonna go get the PCR. So, I, if someone has symptoms, they're doing that at home first, right? To rule out. So we're gonna see that test positivity rate increase because they won't be doing it properly. You're also considering reported cases decrease because the people that are taking the test at home and see if they're positive, if they're not reporting to the state, they're just staying home and locking themselves in a little garage for 10 days. Now. So it's not being reported. We've got these, you know, two two lines moving different ways. We're going to see our test positivity rate probably stay where it's at, and we're going to see new infections you know, conceivably dropping people as stay home even without. So those are two numbers that. And as I've said before, I don't think the number of the zero cases in the school is accurate either. I don't think that a lot of kids are getting tested, so I don't think that they know. The reason they know they have not getting tested, so therefore I don't think that's an accurate number either. Andy. Um, I'll keep that last one myself all week. Well, this is part of the conversation. Um, just extremely disappointed and frustrated all at the same time. Um, I share a lot of the uh, philosophies that some folks have talked to us about today. Um, and I don't understand how we can make decisions for other people on the topic of masks when somebody with a mask can still contract and transmit COVID. Somebody that's vaccinated can still contract and transmit. And somehow we think by mandating masks, we're going to somehow like save everybody. It's really frustrating, disappointing, and sad all at the same time. Um, like, I, I can go online right now and find articles from doctors, scientists um, on one side, and then I can find doctors and scientists on the other side that support the opposite argument. So basically just deferring judgment and decision making to somebody else who you either agree with or, like, I don't think that's a good way to make decisions. So logically to me, I think the right decision is to let individuals choose. I mean, it's, I can't believe we're having this conversation. That's all I got. Additional discussion regarding the current motion or the proposed amendments. Look, personally, I am getting closer, understanding that we, we have the opportunity to get vaccinated. Kids have had the opportunity to get out vaccinated. There's, there's little more to be done. Um, I think to some extent, I agree with you that, that, you know, yeah, we are getting to the point where what we can do to take our own sort of personal uh, steps. Um, but, so I feel like I'm getting closer than I was a few months ago uh, in terms of my own metrics and what I'll, where I'll be to try to change, to change my mind. Uh, 
Um, but I think with the current outbreak, with the, within the, the two-week window post-holiday gathering, um, I would rather wait another you know, one meeting or two meetings, maybe a month, to let those cases have worked themselves out. Um, and I would say that I, my choices are either, I'm going to say, you know, you know, masks for a month, and then we'll revisit it at the beginning of uh, February. One vote I would have, or I think the other one is I think that I like, I like what you're saying, Jeff, and maybe it's not the perfect moment, but I would like to go with something that I could go with that. Uh, as taking my own decision making out of it and putting out sort of the state's uh, guidance. So I, I'm in favor of your, uh, your, your, your motion. Uh, my other choice is just to say let's do not for one more month to, to let all the cases run out. Because part of my frustration is that we've been seesawing on masks for, okay, well, the next holiday or the next vacation, uh, and let's just, you know, make sure we're safe, you know, and then we'll make a decision after that. And then we did that so many times where it was just like, all right, we're just going to have masks for six months or until we're talking, so September to then. So it's like, how long are we going to continue to just kind of seesaw on this? And then, one other thing I wrote down that I didn't read is I have concerns over the long-term detrimental impact of face masks on our youth. We saw an increase in death, depression, and anxiety when students were forced to go 100% remote. What if folks think is going to happen to our youth years from now when we actually have data on what masks are doing? So, again, that's just me. I guess I would say to answer your question, I think I like the idea of moving it towards the New Hampshire state guidance and saying, like, let's go, go another month. That's, that's the safest thing to do, but if we are in that, back over there, let me don't see why we you know, a week from now or two weeks from now. It's, I, if you're if your uh, concern is warranted and in the next month we're going to see cases rise, this motion alleviates that big rate. Assuming people are going to test them. But if it's not warranted, um, then we can be in a mask optional scenario. You know, two yeah. weeks from now. Right? You know, nobody here likes something. Right? So, Concern again is that a year ago we were talking about what scenario we were going to allow masks to be optional, and then we never got there. So, I mean, I'm clearly not going to vote in favor of this, but like, I just I don't understand how this is going to change anything that we've learned over the last. I guess I would say a year ago we were talking about how we were going to get back to school. Um, we were masked off you now. <laughs> so th this is moving in that direction, right? It's the only measure we have. We need to say, well, we can go on. Go ahead. Before you arbitrarily, before we arbitrarily make our own. I mean, I, I think what you're trying to do, Jeff, and, and, and I'll agree to this, is define a beginning and define it, right? Which is something I wanted back in the beginning of the school year is to define a start and an end or, or, or a trigger what causes what what's a center masking situation and what masking situation or an optional masking situation. And so this is this is your you're attempting to define those triggers, right? Correct. Okay. So the, the question then arises is so the triggers that Jeff is using to either make it a masking or non masking situation in this set of circumstances is he's using the set of triggers basically State. We also originally, our original policy, or earlier in the school year, we had a policy that was specific to school related cases. And I don't remember the exact language, but it was grade level specific. Uh, do you mind me taking out of this matrix, but it was in the last one? Um, I think some of you had them stuck in the, the languages on, I think, the second page on the bottom. Yeah, hold on a second. So I would at least say, 
but I don't believe for the sake of this conversation, I see that. One active case in a grade level pre K through six entire grade level masks for two weeks or until there are no cases in their grade. One active case in grade seven or eight, both grade levels masks for two weeks or until there are no active cases in those grades. Three or more grade levels with active cases, entire school masks for two weeks or until there are no active grade levels with classes and cases. So that was the original plan that we put in place back in the say September. So, what if we would with the board now? I understand yes, motions on the table. We're trying to find a compromise that may or may not work for everybody. Would this board consider adopting that again with it taking effect? Say, uh, Say two weeks from, or two weeks from. Will we have a chance to allow any potential Christmas or New Year surges to clear through, or make themselves apparent when that policy will go for that procedure? So that's, I'm only right now that this is a currently motion to vote, just asking for a sense to see if it's worth it. I think the concern I would have with that would be that's the scenario we're in right now. Secretly, it's very impactful to get 86 percent, 80 percent of the staff in our favor of um, students being masked right now. Um, and I, I think that that needs to be taken into consideration. You know, we're asking for some of the newer Sully students. So, you know, you should just, I just want to put it out there that if we adopted that, that would be essentially saying, you know, thank you. Right. Well, certainly, the masks would be optional. We didn't put it in effect for the number of days, or the you know, number of days it is. It would allow the potential cases to any potential Christmas holiday surges. So we've historically seen two weeks from a holiday, we seem to see a fairly consistent opportunity. I, I first and foremost, our, our priority here is educating our kids, and I feel like the biggest concern right now, we agree, is not necessarily um, sick kids. Well, yes, sick kids are a concern, but we're not seeing the number of these things making people out of sick. Um, that said, there are schools in our neighborhood that are on the, on the edge of shutting down because it's the faculty who are getting sick, and you can't run a school in person, and we're not allowed to run it remote. So, if we really want to make sure we want to educate our kids in person for the next month, I think this is the safest, you know, proactive route is to take is to use masks because you know a student can be out if he or she is sick, you know, but to have a teacher is going to be more impactful. And that's just as important, but more important than the school the kids are here. So I, I really feel like we should still be cautious. You know, I hear your point, Andy. Yeah, uh, but at the same time, I would I would vote for being cautious for another month. So you, you, I like just motion. I think this other one from the step of school made, I think it's too many at this moment. I, I also think that there's a risk of making, I, and I'm, I, I'm not trying to, because um, I think I was accused of this before. I, I'm not trying to um, denigrate anybody's work on that self made. They made it though because we asked them to make it, and I'm uh, so I'm not I'm not in favor of going to that meeting because it's it's not necessarily we don't we don't necessarily have science to base that matrix on. I mean it makes sense it's logical, but I I get uncomfortable when I go to the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. And the recommendation says that K through 12 schools is recommended to wear masks in order to mitigate COVID 19. I get comfortable, uncomfortable making decisions based against, uh, that would go against what that is saying. 
Um, and everything that is, I, I, you know, I think the thing I'm most sad about, if I'm really gonna, you know, to, to Andy's point about feeling frustrated and sad, is that we, we have no common science in and we can all throw out science and study. But I'm trying to look at the organizations that are are the ones that we have relied on for a long time to regulate and help us make health related decisions. And so um, I, I, I think that uh, I'm probably moving closer to feeling um, in support of Jeff's motion, um, as long as it stays and remains, you know, workable, like that, it, that you know, not afraid to revisit it, uh, and that it remains workable uh, for the staff, students, and the administration. I do know of schools that kind of went with that same one, and the only reason I'm saying this is because I. I've heard of cases in Rochester where they had masks on, masks off, based on that same kind of data. And it was um, not a great situation because families were like, is it mask day, is it not mask day? Why do I have to wear, oh, we're wearing masks, you know? And it was, it was a weekly, it was a weekly thing. It, it also, their cases spiked very early. And, and they had uh, a situation where they had lots of staff, lots of faculty members out. And that was early on back in Delta. Yep. And I think to your point, you know, this was one of the concerns we had when we went masks up in the beginning of the year. You know, we didn't have a surplus of masks available. I think now it's become something that we've become so used to living with that, well, hey, you Mask on, they maybe they announced here's a mask, a mask mandatory, you know, until Friday, we'll reassess. So, where it was off, parents scrambling. I know I went through trying to find masks for the kids and all of that. Um, but I think now we've got enough masks in the building that it shows up and we just forgot that the phone call now to help simplify their data or simplifying it. But I think that. To get us to a step further from where we are, it's based on the best resources we have, right? And it's not a gut decision, it's not an emotional decision, it's based on what we've been given. It gives the community clarity, um, even though I'm not going to like it because currently we're still being masks. Um, it does give us that way. That the weekly fluctuations that we see in the issue, we meet every two weeks and can reassess. But I think it's a step in the right direction rather than just arbitrarily picking the can um, down the road. It accomplishes that goal of let's move it a month because we're concerned with all this. We're going to be in mass because we are in December. So give us that one. So it also gives a little bit of it. Yes, just to, I don't know if this will wrap it up or not, but um, they just did a quick look at our, our attendance. And um, just to give you some numbers, so yesterday we had six students out from the building, plus students out of the building um, that were out reporting because they were quarantined. Today we have 14 kids out, out of the 50 plus kids that were out of the grounds at um, 14 kids we were testing and quarantine. Um, so I, I just, I, I don't know what tomorrow will bring, but I just, and that's for the people that told us that information. We had several people who didn't give us any reason why they were speaking out, and we had lots of kids out because they have cough and sneeze and we all know that there's no such thing as no symptoms right now. We, we have, you know, you grow up, grow, wake up with something on your nose, it's a symptom. Everything is a symptom. So we got kids that are coughing and sneezing and sore throats and 
I don't know if they'll get tested or not, but you know, I don't. So I just want to throw that out there. And also, um, of the staff that, that answered the, the survey, there were 97 staff members. So this isn't based on you know, four, 15, 20, 25. Years. That's almost 100 percent, which is, as you know, the survey is unprecedented. Um, we have 105 or so staff members, so 97 people responded to that, which, which gives you a solid base in terms of what staff would like to, to see. Um, and just to remind you that the bus is mass, there's so many things. So I don't think that kind of regulation is not as so that's just something to keep in terms of people, you know, like that. So um, I don't know. I just, um, just wanted to throw that information out there. Just some. So if any of them is the best motion, can we read it one more time? Should bookmark that. Yeah. <laughs> Should you pen in there or something? Well, it's basically the same thing that we had with using. So is it basically the same as the last time that it was? So it's, um, the motion to adopt the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services mass maker based on our town level data, assessment of the most recently available data on the state of New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services COVID-19 website shall be done every Friday with parents being notified of the upcoming week's mask requirement by the end of day Friday. If during any week the school is, a mask op is in a mask optional scenario and cases rise to a level where masking is suggested by the matrix to be mandatory, Staff shall notify families via one call now, and masks shall be required the following day until the end of that week, where a new assessment of the data will be done for the upcoming week. All right. Take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 No. So you're on the state's state. It doesn't matter, so yeah. And so to clarify, more than five were in the basket. And you're down. All right. You're down with that? Let's move on. I think we have, uh, I, have I did not see PPO, so I'm assuming they do not have an update for us. Second for me. Okay. You have a vacation report? <laughs> I actually was able to gather quite a bit of information, I'm sorry to say. So it's late, so I'll go through it quickly. Uh, this covers no uh, sorry, December 16th to January 5th. So happy new year with the holiday season. Um, as you know, basketball season is up and running. Parks and Rec program is up and running, we have no more fires left, so now Parks and Rec is able to adjust their schedule uh, to get more practices. Our eighth graders have great visit to Comfort High School before we put the holiday break on Friday, December 17th. Um, in addition to that, the club cards went out that day on December 17th. We, uh, as you know, how I reported about last time, two report cards were sent out. We have a day five report card. Our preschool reports is something. K to five report card and our sixth grade um, report card went out for middle school. Um, the middle school summatives are average over the course of the trimester, which is sort of great on reports. Um, and so many of you may, may have seen on your child's report card, they had a 1.7 or a 3.8 or a, um, you know, 3.5. So kids could see that there were problems that they were making between um, 3 or 2 and 3 or 1. So um, we evidence. Um, we did not receive any feedback. Um, yay or nay uh, on the report card. I, I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but um, I have not heard anything, so I don't know if you have or not. Um, um, our staff also enjoyed a nice holiday gathering at Longview School, um, which is such a beautiful school, beautiful location. Um, on Friday, December 17th, we were able to gather and have um, a couple laughs and um, a nice time there. 
Um, I would like to give a big shout out to Mr. Lee. He set up our uh, the next wave CNC router. Um, he brought a sample. This is the wood uh, working machine that wood printer that was purchased with surplus last year. Um, and he was finally able to get uh, space and the back of the art room that's in the Tiki's classroom. Um, this, if you can't tell, it's a dragon. I know that's that we're in the very beginning phases of, of learning this. Um, so that it just got drilled in. He recently ordered some new little bits so that um, so that we can do more fine detail. Um, but this is just one of the samples of, of uh, something he just did quickly. Um, uh, we Vicky and Ms. Uh, Chase will work over on our professional development day in January. They're going to learn the software. Ross is going to teach them how to use it. They're going to um, practice it. And um, pretty soon, your kids are coming home with some nice treasures. That, um, I'll talk about a good trade. Right? Like, that's amazing. Totally. That would be and great for your kids. Yeah. 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 It's real. And the kids were so machine and that room got like a bucket of water and hook it up and yeah, it's quite impressive and he was very excited to show as many people as he could on um, yesterday when we all came. Um, yeah. You'll, you'll, have to, you'll have to go see it one of these times. Yeah. Very likable. Like um, also I want to give a big shout out to Mr. Kufos, um, Mr. Greaves dream and vision of finally having a home locker room anyway but that's not quite done yet yeah. it's, it's, almost done. it's not as fancy as the home one um but the mr kofis kufos was able to clean out all everything that was in there you know there were racks and life jackets and um he was able to put a lot of it in our storage shed and um we had that we bought benches last year with our surplus. He built those. Those have been attached to the ground, put a big whiteboard up. Um, Mr. Green has the vision of putting um, hooks around in the, sh in the shower area um, so that kids can hang their backpacks and uh, their jackets. So it's, uh, it, uh, it looks great. It, it really does. So a big shout out to Mr. Green's vision. And he always has a nice vision. Do you have concerns with your handicaps? Uh, the kids have access to a lot uh, well, predominantly the coaches will be in there with them. Okay. So it's essentially they drop um, drop their stuff off, and the only other time will be a half time when they're in there okay. and the coaches. So, yeah. There's a movie quote there, but it's not. December 20th was 888 admin day. We were able to meet with art second grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, and eighth grade just to get some. Um, you know, just to meet, touch base, talk about the program that they're doing. Um, just some quick things in art. We, uh, they're getting ready, obviously, for 2022. They finished up there, making their, did their craft fix and made gifts for holidays for families. Um, our intern, Joe Filoni, has moved on to, uh, um, to Dover High School. You know, art and people both have, they both got a fall and a spring intern because, um, you know, their kids are certified. <clears throat> so they get experience here, and then they have to get experience on the other end. And we did welcome um, Morgan McCabe uh, for the second half of the year in our art group. She's um, going to be here with us until the school year. We also welcomed Gail Bigelow for the second half of the year in PE, and Noah Devers has moved on to, I'm not sure who's that here, I'm sorry. But, um, so it's, um, they came started yesterday, and they, um, are a welcome addition to our intern program. Uh, second grade is working on their opinion unit. They, um, I don't know if you want to think about second grade, but they started their addition and subtraction with regrouping. <laughs> That's always a very important skill. Um, fourth grade has did an awesome um, time, had an awesome time during the holiday, week leading up to the holiday. Um, they had Fire Pit Friday, they had hot cocoa, they were working on their digital book reports. Um, they're looking at uh, finishing their biography night before April vacation and would like to um, post it outside this year. So they are, their wheels are turning and how they're going to do that. Um, thank you to the community as always that support the fifth grade calendar project. They sold out this year and will not be reordering um, the, uh, the calendars, but they did sell out. They're also the process of 
working on their uh, planning their their uh, Boston field trip. They will go to Boston in the spring. Uh, they will not stay overnight at Boston Museum of Science. Um, but they are planning, hoping to extend the day. So getting we're going to work on presentation, whether it's their presentation or coach bus, which is obviously very expensive. They talked about the train, uh, so please stay tuned for that information. They're also working with business launch to some STEM projects, looking at how to do a the big STEM project. And then um, sixth grade team who started their Mesopotamia team unit. If you had a sixth grader, you know that that's a big deal. Um, an upcoming event for, for sixth grade is Nature's Classroom, which comes from Sargent Center. They are actually going to come to DCS the week right before vacation. They're going to be spending three days here and are really excited about the opportunity to spend more how and place for our outdoor classrooms. So um, stay tuned for more information about that. And our eighth grade has been working with Chris Kukos, Chris Motika, on uh, the climate unit that they're doing. It's an interdisciplinary unit. They feel really excited about it. And Three projects that they're going to get going, five components. It's a big grand project and some lofty goals, but um, they really they're going to spend a month of January doing some free teaching about the, the, um, the different things that they need to do, and um, they're very excited about that. Today we have PD Wednesday, our preschool to fifth grade had some team time, and our middle school team met uh, with Chris Motika to start our work on the building the culture of middle school. And um, upcoming, uh, the STAR testing window has opened for January for our STAR assessments. And our eighth graders will be testing through the NAEP testing. We were chosen um, this year's NAEP testing. It's just affecting our eighth graders, and that's on in, in February. So I'll have more information about that. Just in case coming up. Questions? So, Mr. Kelly, I believe we've covered everything that would apply to the building expansion. Yes. Mr. Oxnard, I believe there is nothing to really discuss regarding high school options because we were in between talks, correct? Correct. Okay, and the NBC approved the school district's budget last night. And so that's all I have for that. Uh, what's the, you have the date of the, the, uh, the uh, Wednesday of next week. No, I'm sorry. February <laughs> 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 9th, 12th. Uh, it's in my budget binder. Which 19th. Is budget binder? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's Saturday. Can you do me the 4th? No, it's the 12th. So the 12th. You're close. So that being said, uh, you want me to do that? <laughs> the, uh, so yeah, so. The other thing is, uh, the town moderator did ask me to find out uh, if we can place him on the schedule to review one article prior to the meeting. So I would say probably the next meeting we have would be an appropriate time to have him come in Monday, Tuesday. No, I'm sorry. You mean the next, next regular, regular meeting? meeting. <laughs> the so 19th? The 19th, so I'll pass that on to him. I know that we can put him on the agenda and you can place him just to be cognizant of his time because it's a topic. Yeah. I'll relay that to him. Uh, and then I believe uh, he may he mentioned the warning to get some clarification on handle with how to handle the bond part. So yeah, yes. okay. if you can help me connect the dots with him and any of those bits and pieces. Yes. Appreciate it. Yeah. What time does that start? Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 And we're having the deliberative will be over here. Looks here. Unless the board decides that you don't want to be I was asked by John Harrington and said I'd consult with the board. So uh, last year we went off site um, because of COVID, but the, this year the select board will be we'll holding theirs at the no, at the fairgrounds. Um, so potentially hold it there, or we can just as easily have it here. Historically, not had a huge attendance. I'd, I'd be shocked if we didn't draw a crowd this year. So, yeah. I mean, we didn't draw a crowd. I, I have to imagine that the the on and on the yeah. bell that is that can't draw a crowd for that. Yeah. I'm not. So, I just assume having here, it's easier. We have access to our resources and information and stuff. We can do it in the gym. There's plenty of room. 
which is it's going to be a very fatiguing time. Sorry, the delivery okay. session is February 5th. Town. The town. Yeah. Oh, okay. What the following the following the so we have heat gear, which they don't have down at the fairgrounds. Yeah, and I don't want to be cold. And if it runs long, I don't want to be cold. Yeah, no, we can do it in the gym. I thought you were talking about this. No. Yeah. Well, you and I have to sit next to each other. That's okay. I don't like it. All right. Some days. Okay, uh, so we'll put uh, the uh, moderator on the agenda, and I'll look to American and we're going to hold it up here. All right, uh, seeing as it's, we're pushing what, 10 o'clock? Mm -hmm. Pushing 10 o'clock. Uh, are we comfortable tabling policies to the next meeting? Yes. Most of our first reading. Do you want me to, I can review the meeting. Okay. That's fine. There's no, there's no action. Yeah, no, we don't have a spending plan that we have to enact right away. Okay. So we can, we're going to push those items off. Public comments? Anybody from the public that has endured? I think that would be Ms. Baker. That's me. Um, Your stamina is, is just phenomenal. All that endurance from me. <laughs> um, just a couple of quick things. Um, the on the masking policy and, and reverting back to the um, suggestion that was made at that October meeting. Um, I think you know, I I'm definitely sensitive to the fact that like you have been provided with pretty much nothing to make these decisions on. And I think that that's you know, I understand that and wanting to hinge your decision making on something. Like, I, I totally get that. Um, I think it's just, as Zach had mentioned a couple of times, and we've talked about a couple of times, it's just the idea that if there are four cases in this town, we have to require 500 students to mask is just so absurd to me that I, I don't, I just don't even know how to like sort of process that because it's just, it's so absurd. I mean, if my household gets it, we're at substantial spread and we're in one house together doing nothing. Um, it just doesn't seem logical at all. And to, to reference the CDC study that you mentioned, Jeff, um, about the classrooms that are mand mask mandates in schools versus those without schools, if we apply the same logic that the DHHS is asking us to apply and we titrate that down to our local level, it quickly becomes statistically insignificant whether or not we have a mask mandate, because I don't know of any school with 100,000 students. Um, so if we're going to say, if, if you know, our health experts are telling us this methodology is good enough here, and we say, OK, it's good enough there, so let's apply it here as well, we're, again, asking 500 students to mask to potentially save one case, maybe, probably not even, not even one case, if we look at those numbers. It just, it, it's difficult because while I do understand that you're, you're looking for something to hope, you know, hang your hat on in a way to make this decision, at some point, you're just going to have to decide what it's over. I mean, that's really the takeaway of all of this. It's been two years now. You all are going to have to do some soul searching and just figure out what you're comfortable with and when you're comfortable saying enough is enough because this is endemic. We are always going to have four cases in your field. We're, Every winter, we're going to go back to having some cases. We now realize that being vaccinated doesn't stop the spread. It doesn't keep you from transmitting it. Um, you know, we have three widely available, free, effective vaccines, including those for children. I just, I'm not sure what else needs to happen in order to reverse this. And, and while we talk about, you know, well, we want to see how the holidays shake out. Okay, but then we're into February break. And then it's like, okay, well, let's see how February break shakes out. Okay, well, now we're into April break. And it's just it's just never ending. It's never ending. And that's that's where a lot of frustration comes from. It's just the fact that it's never ending. Um, and the, the real, the, at, the, at the heart of it, 
there's going to come a point where you just have to decide when you're done. And, and as much as I hate for you to have to make that decision, because I understand that it's a difficult one, and you know, I'm not a health expert, you're not a health expert. Frankly, I'm not even sure health experts are health experts anymore. Um, it's just, that's just the reality of it. And we're always going to be dealing with it. Um, so we really just need to come to that, have that come to Jesus moment of when we're going to say enough is enough. So that's, um, that's my only note on the, the masking part. I did have a couple of notes and thoughts on the cost impact, because I think the board member, Oxnard, brought up some really great points around the sticker shock of that number of the expansion, which, first of all, I think it was great. I, it's, I'm so excited about it. I think it's fantastic. Um, but I think Nate brought up some really good points about, you know, and everyone here talks about how it's important to have great learning spaces and it's important to address safety issues and, and nobody is, is arguing that. But at the end of the day, there is a large contingent of our voting base that just doesn't care. They see that number and the answer is no, that's it. And so we, and you as a building expansion committee in conjunction with the Valley um, Resinger, really need to talk about messaging. Um, messaging is going to be whether or not this thing passes or fails. It's gonna come down to messaging and communication and whether or not we are speaking to the pain points of those folks because they are going to be the ones, because frankly, they're the ones that turn up at the polls. And, you know, we can do all we can to encourage people to show up at the polls. And I try to encourage everybody I know to show up at the polls, whether they agree with me or not, I don't care. Just show up and vote. Um, but the fact of the matter is a lot of the younger families don't show up. and They're the ones with the biggest skin in the game. So it's going to come down to messaging to them that, hey, you need to show up but then also messaging to that group of folks that are just, you know, gonna really push back on that cost. Um, so I think we need to make sure that there's a response for that, that we communicate to them what's in it for me. And frankly, I don't think a community center is enough for what's in it for them. I don't think that that's gonna move the needle. I don't think they're gonna care. Um, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm being cynical, but um, I think we need to talk to them in terms of property value, which you kind of addressed a little bit. Um, and then also uh, talk to them in terms of legacy and what they're passing down as an asset to their own children and the money that they are transferring to their own children via higher property value or if they decide to sell and move to Florida or wherever they may want to go. Um, but they're creating more value in that asset that then benefits them. Um, I think we also should talk to um, La Valley Dressinger, understand uh, or ask for maybe testimonials from uh, voters that are like-minded in other towns where these types of projects have passed so that we can have them come tell their story of like, hey, I was really hesitant on this because I just got sticker shock and I, I'm on fixed income or whatever, but now that I see it in practice, I'm glad that it went through or whatever. Let's tell some of those stories and get some storytelling around that um, so that those voters can see themselves reflected. Um, and then also the, any kind of data we can get around the increase in property values or if there's any kind of data we can get around that sort of asset growth that we can convey, I think would also be valuable. Um, and let's examine too, in conjunction with the Valley Resident Area, let's examine the messaging that they used in towns where these things are passed. So we can get an idea of, you know, what are they saying to them and how can we replicate that here? How can we drive that home for our voters um, as well? And then finally, um, one note on the high school thing. Um, I will admit I'm kind of out of the loop on the high school options. And so you said that we are in between talks and I'm the last person here. So can we kind of talk about like, what does that mean in between talks of what, with who, can you, can you give like a little bit more info on the, what's going on with the high school? Um, so the whole process, and actually only the FAQs that we were talking about that's going to be closed to Joe, um, but the abbreviated version is that this whole, there's nothing that's going to be finalized until it goes to the voters, right? So we're in the process of negotiating something, kind of like a teacher's, a teacher's contract that would go to the voters. This is going to be a, a similar sort of language contract that can go to the voters. Um, the committee work that happened last year um, identified narrowed down all the high schools down there that were interested in us down to six schools um, that were all within about the half hour drive and um, not one of the plots, but going directly. Um, 
And um, and so then really the committee finalized it, wrapped it up, with basically saying that if we could provide choice to all students in the town, that would be ideal. Not so much even just two schools. If we could, if we could open it up to all schools and provide busing, like that's kind of the most equitable arrangement as possible. So I think that's that's our goal. That's part of where we're starting from. But we recognize that cost and logistics are going to factor in that. So here we are. We have so far spoken to two schools. We have eventually meet. We've spoken to two schools, but contract negotiations are contract negotiations. So you can't mention which specific schools? Uh, we mentioned it. So we've, we've spoken with Go Brown and we've spoken with Copper. And, and we're currently speaking. The, the, the outcome of those discussions are ongoing, so unfortunately we can't discuss what the outcome is until the outcome is done, because it's a contract. Um, so unfortunately, as frustrating as it may be here, we have very much heard the community, and now we are trying to work to something that the community has asked us for, but that is a process that takes time. And, um, we, uh, we're supporting the process scheduling our next meeting and we will continue and there's, there's just a lot of moving parts. So I understand it's frustrating, I get it, but it's a contract negotiation and contract negotiation is not going to um, One last thing on the FAQs, actually, Vincent. If you do decide to do that via like a Word doc or PDF or something that someone is, you're going to link to on the FAQ site, can, I would only suggest that you um, be at the top, say, last updated on and have a date. Um, just so as it gets updated, users then know, like, this is the most current information. I see it's been updated recently. I can trust that it's accurate. Yep. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right. Um, we don't need to do the non public tonight. So we don't have any appointments or resignation. So I would go ahead and ask for a motion to get here. So moved. Do I have a second? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good everybody. Have a good night. <laughs> no. 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 We're all leaving. <laughs> the language is hard enough. Yeah, you know, it's a long meeting. <laughs>